Your mic's not on now. Mm -hmm. Let me try it again. There we go. Okay. Toombs is here. Alan, Benedict, Druffle is here. Glover Mendez is here. Porterfield, Roten, Sledge, Suara, Syracuse, Vircher is here. And that's nine members present. That is a quorum. All right, Budget and Finance is called to order. We do have a consent agenda this afternoon. I'm going to read off the um, resolution numbers and bill number of the items that are on the consent agenda. Um, if you want to pull something off, if you could raise your hand. I've been told that the request to speak function on the um, on our iPads or whatever they're called, tablets, uh, is not working. So resolution 2021-990. Resolution 2021-992, Resolution 2021-993, Resolution 2021-994, 995, 996, 997, 998, 1001, 1002, 1003, and Bill 2021-743. Do any of those items need to come off of consent? Councilwoman Suara. Uh, 1002, please. Are there any other items that need to come off of consent? All right, seeing no hands, I will read the captions. Resolution 2021-990, Toombs and Welch, approves a parental assistance court grant from the Tennessee Department of Human Services to the Metro Juvenile Court for additional staff to provide opportunities for and meet the needs of eligible low-income families who have a court-ordered child support obligation. Resolution 2021-993. 993 Withers, Swara, Toombs, and Welsh approves $471,239 of income in the Capital Mall Urban Development Action Grant to the Metro Development and Housing Agency for the construction of affordable housing at Envision Casey. Resolution 2021-994, Toombs, Taylor, and Welsh approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to provide the Community Health Access and Navigation in Tennessee program to deliver comprehensive care coordination services to eligible families and children. Resolution 2021-995, Toombs, Taylor, and Welsh approves an amendment to a contract between the Metro Board of Health and the Tennessee Department of Health for arbovirus testing of mosquito samples for West Nile virus. Resolution 2021-996, Toombs, Taylor, Welsh, Hancock, and Hurt approves an amendment to a grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to the Metro Board of Health for the ongoing collection of data on ambient air concentrations for fine particulate matter in Nashville, Tennessee. Resolution 2021-997, Toombs, Taylor, and Bradford approves a grant from the Friends of Metro Animal Care and Control to the Metro Board of Health to provide emergency medical care to animals. Resolution 2021-998, Toombs, Taylor, Welsh, and Bradford approves a Partners in Protection Shelter Program participation agreement for discounts between the Metro Board of Health and Behringer Ingleham Animal Health USA, Inc. to offer discounted vaccines and medicines for shelter animals and Metro Animal Care and Control. Resolution 2021 1001, Toombs and Gamble, approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration to the Metro Nashville Police Department to reimburse costs associated with the response to the Christmas Day bombing on 2nd Avenue. Resolution 2021-1003, Toombs and Gamble, approves a grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Office of Emergency Management to provide resources to procure items, training, and or equipment for hazardous materials preparedness. And Bill 2021-743, O'Connell, Toombs, and Murphy approves the purchase and sale agreement between the Metro Government and Piedmont Natural Gas Company, Inc. for a parcel of property and improvements located at 800 2nd Avenue North. Are there any items that need to come off of consent? <laughs> Councilwoman Allen. Madam Chair, I apologize. I was late, so you may have already done this. RS 2021-996. All right. And then I just have a question on 2021-743, if I could pull that off just to ask a good question. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other items that need to come off of consent? 
Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Resolution 2021-932, Toombs establishes the certified tax rate in the general services district and declares the amount of the certified rate for the urban services district pursuant to Tennessee code. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Resolution 2021-985, Toombs, Rutherford, and Hurt adopts a new pay plan for the general employees of the Metro government, excluding employees of the Board of Health, Board of Education, and the Police and Fire Departments, effective July 1st, 2021. You can take the next two together with it if you want to. All right, we can take the next two together. Resolution 2021-986, Toombs, Rutherford, Taylor, and Hurt adopts a new pay plan for employees of the Metro Board of Health, effective July 1, 2021 as well as Resolution 2021-987, Toombs, Rutherford, Gamble, and Hurt adopts a new pay plan for the employees of Metro Departments of Police and Fire, effective July 1st, 2021. And there's a substitute on all of them. Can I get a motion to approve the substitute? It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the substitute that is adopt oh. see it. Councilman Mendez. Thanks. Um just uh, uh, briefly, I guess, for the viewing audience, the, if I understand correctly, um, if your substitute budget gets adopted, then we'll move the substitutes tomorrow. And if for some reason that didn't happen, but it's going to, but if somehow it didn't, then we'd move the original. Is that right? Yes. Correct. Any additional discussion on the substitutes? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Can I get a motion to approve the resolutions as substituted? So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve resolutions 2021, 985, 986, and 987. As substituted, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Resolution 2021-988, Toombs, Sledge, and Hurt, repeals the additional privilege tax on litigation applied to criminal cases as established in Resolution RS-2008-490. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Director Cooper, for the view and audience, do you mind ex just briefly explaining what this is doing? Sure, so this resolution and the next rec resolution are implementing recommendations from a um, recent study that Metro uh, procured looking at fines and fees and the impacts on uh, criminal defendants and especially those who are um, of lower income. And so the, the study recommended the elimination of certain fees and taxes that are assessed on court cases. And so resolution 988 um, would repeal the court security litigation tax, which is currently set at $15 per case. And that by state law, that's on all civil and criminal cases. And then 989 would eliminate the $12 and 50 cent additional fee uh, that is um, used to defray the cost of representing indigent, indigent defendants. So that's a fee that goes to the public defender. Um, technically, it all comes to the general fund, but it, it's for indigent, uh, indigent defense. Um, I would note that the substitute budget, both the original budget and the substitute budget, includes a roughly $650,000 contingency uh, to essentially cover any lost revenue as a result of eliminating the various fines and fees. Um, so that amount is covered in the budget. Any additional, are you, Councilwoman Suara? I know it's gonna be a long night, so I'm gonna keep it very brief. We just wanna speak in support of it. I think oftentimes we have a lot of people in the court system that cannot afford to pay fines 
uh, and get to stay there longer and just becomes a big circle. So I'm grateful for the study and that we'll be eliminating those fees. Any additional discussion? All those in favor of resolution 2021-988 say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Resolution 2021-989, Toon, Sledge, and Hurt. Uh, repeals resolution numbers R884 through 128 pertaining to the assessment and collection of a fee to defray the cost of representing indigent defendants. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Resolution 2021-991, Tombs, authorizes the extension of the Metro government's water and sewer revenue commercial paper program and the amendment of the terms of the credit facility. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilman Mendez. I'm sorry, is this 991? Yes. Um, just because it's such a large dollar amount, um, if Mr. Cooper could run through um, the, this, how this uh, renewal of a standard program and the interest is, I guess, very, a little bit better than the old program. Yeah, so this is an extension of the water sewer commercial paper program. If you'll recall at the last meeting, the council approved um, a, not really an extension, but a, a another commercial paper program for the general government. This is for water sewer capital projects. It keeps the same bank as the liquidity facility. It just extends the term. And because of Metro's, uh, the improvement in Metro's bond rating, the fee that Metro will pay the bank for serving as the liquidity facility is going down slightly. So. Um, this will extend the program and save Metro a little bit of money. Any additional? Councilwoman Suara. I know that oftentimes we gloss over some things, uh, and I just think it's important for us to stress uh, what a good job the finance department has done in refinancing all these bonds and commercial papers and saving the county money. Uh, uh, and I think it's also good to stress considering everything that is going on with the referendum, the, the credit standing of the city at this point in time. Uh, when things are going well, we don't talk about it enough. And I think it's important for people to understand that where we are and the ability to be able to get this good rate is because of the good work and the refinancing and everything that has gone into it. And I just wanted to stress that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any additional discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of passing resolution 2021-991, say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Resolution 2021-996, Toombs, Taylor, Welsh, and others approves an amendment to a grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to the Metro Board of Health for the ongoing collection of data on ambient air co concentrations for fine particulate matter in Nashville, Tennessee. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just I wanted to ask, I know that in the past I've been able to find annual reports that give uh, the results of these um, these measurements so that we can see year to year that, that we've gotten better and, and what the different pollutants are. And I, have, I was not able to find those reports um, on, the, um, on the Metro Health website. So if there's someone from Metro Health here, thanks, Tom, um, they can tell us if those are still being done and, and if we can get to them. They are. I'll, I'll take that up with John, make sure he knows. Uh, I'll get those posted. Okay. The mic is not working back there, but I heard they are. <laughs> and that he'll get, he will get them posted promptly. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion on resolution 2021-996? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right, we do have a late file resolution. Tunes corrects a typographical error to an amendment. Oh, no, there was a 1002. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. 
Resolution 2021-1002, Toombs, Gamble, and Hancock, approves an application for a Project Safe Neighborhood Grant from the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration to the Metro Nashville Police Department to reduce gun violence in Nashville. Uh, can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councilwoman Suara? Thank you, Madam Chair. And oftentimes I would not say no to money from the state and I'm not saying no in this case. Uh, but as I was looking at the fiscal analysis and reading what this grant is about, it's a grant from the state to help Nashville reduce gun violence. Uh, uh, but I wanted to say on record that while the money and redu reducing gun violence is great, I think what we would prefer as a mother, as a constituent from the state is good gun, uh, uh, a very great uh, gun sense love. <laughs> I can't even, I'm, I'm, I'm getting emotional about it, but we need good laws, uh, uh, guns, uh, laws that are sensible uh, for our people. And I think that's where the reduction comes, not just going after when something is happening and then putting money uh, uh, to, to fight it. So I'm just saying on the record that we want the state of Tennessee to pass sensible gun laws uh, that will actually reduce violence. Thank you. Any additional discussion on Resolution 2021-1002? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. We do have a, a late filed resolution by Toons, corrects a typographical error to an amendment in the grant contract amount from the Tennessee Department of Children's Services to the Davidson County Juvenile Court for a safe baby court to risk to serve at-risk children. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion on this late file resolution? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Moving on to bills on second reading, Bill 2021-727, Roberts, Toombs, Murphy, and Nash, declare surplus and approves the disposition of a parcel of property known as Zero American Road. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. There is a letter to approve from the sponsor, Councilwoman Roberts, uh, and there's also an amendment. Can someone move the amendment? It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the amendment. Any discussion? Did you? Councilwoman Allen. Um, I'll just say I have gone back and forth with a number of housing, uh, affordable housing providers just to see if this is possibly a piece of land that could be used for that. And it, it is a floodplain. It has a shared driveway with two other houses that are already filling up that driveway um, and some water easements and all the affordable housing people um, have said it seems like it might be a very difficult use for that. So I appreciate the opportunity to have explored that um, and the patience that everyone has, has given me to ask my questions, but I'm, I'm satisfied that when they say unbuildable that that's an accurate description. And Director Cooper, since the sponsor isn't here, what does the amendment do? Uh, the, the amendment corrects um, avenue to road, just housekeeping. All right, any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Can I get a motion on the bill as amended? It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the bill as amended. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Bill 2021-743, O'Connell, Toombs, and Murphy approves the purchase and sale agreement between the Metro government and Piedmont Natural Gas Company, Inc. for a parcel of property and improvements located at 800 Second Avenue North. Can I get a motion? Did it, was there a motion? Okay, <laughs> it's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, uh, we've had explained what, what this is and that there's some mitig environmental mitigation issues that we would rather have Piedmont gas pay for than us, and I understand all that. My, my question is, I mean, Metro has used this for a number of years uh, and have decided that we can no longer use it for our, our own beneficial use. Is there someone that can address why we didn't just keep using it instead of deciding we had to sell it? Mm -hmm. 
we have uh, not only Mr. Cross here from Metro, Le uh, Metro Legal, but also Eddie Davidson from Piedmont Gas. Um, let me turn it over to Mr. Cross first, and then I'll look to Mr. Pete, uh, Mr. Davidson if he has any additional thought. To answer your specific question, there's some concern that the environmental residue from the uh, manufactured gas operation from years ago um, might be drifting towards the boundaries of the property and the, it really needs to be undertaken sooner rather than later. And to anticipate something that you, you might have implied in your question, um, we've done quite a bit of environmental testing to make sure that the, the, the interior of the building is safe for the employees. I see Mr. Davidson, but I don't know that he has anything to add. He's waving me off, so thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Councilwoman Suara. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is on the money part of it, and I think that I've, I, what I'm worried about, and I just want if someone would speak to that, is the fact that this is an area that is growing. Uh, uh, the value of property in that area is rising, and it will be a lot. And so my concern is if we sell at this rate to Piedmont, and then after the cleanup and everything, uh, the value tripled or quadrupled. Uh, why can't we clean it ourselves and then get the benefit of, a, of an area that is, uh, of a land that is worth a lot right now, or might, uh, considering what is going on all around it? Um, and so I'm just worried that we might just be selling it very cheap, and then we may need to turn around and buy it at a very higher price. So we originally purchased the property in 1989 for about 1.9. At the time, and this is important, I know you're asking about the fiscal impact, but at the time, Metro was apparently aware of the environmental implications of what was on the property. And that has some real significant implications for our potential liability and cleanup obligations to going down the road. We're selling it now for about 4.2, so making a, an appreciable profit already. After that, after the environmental cleanup is completed, and, and remember that's estimated at about a $24 million price tag, then yes, Piedmont will place it, presumably place it on the market for sale, but Metro retains per the contract the right of first refusal. So we have the right to match whatever the market actually bears at a given moment, because who knows what it'll be worth and the amount of time it takes them to clean it up. And if somebody offers an appreciably larger value for it then, that's probably a good indication of the market value. And we have the right not to exceed that, just to meet it, and then we, we get it. We get the right of first refusal. But we're not obligated to do so. So that, I think, protects us to capture the value of the property if we want it, if we want it. The two departments that are on there now, Metro Action Commission and Social Services, our public property division, Trail Web, is very actively looking for other locations for them to be located, preferably on uh, transit uh, uh, route, preferably adjacent to one another. Uh, and we've got, because of the closing date being postponed until the end of December of 22, that should give him, I spoke with Mr. Webb today, he believes that's ample time to locate those two other departments. So um, if we go around and get a place for these other departments to stay in, we could be incurring additional costs. And so we may not make as high a profit that we think we'll be making on this deal. That, that assumes that we're buying private property. And I think Mr. Webb is looking at all properties, including metro properties, that would be sufficient for this location. It also doesn't foreclose the possibility of leasing property to locate these properties. There may be an interim location in the meantime. So would you speak, and I want you to be able to say this because I asked you this this morning, specifically to why is it not better for us to do the cleaning and possibly be the one that we sell at a higher rate in, in Germantown or where that area is where it's an hot market, rather than selling and possibly coming back and buying it back at a higher rate? Can you speak to the reason why? that is not an option. Right, the obligation could be entirely on us. If we were to challenge, and, and this discussion with Piedmont began as to whose responsibility it was for the cleanup. And, and under federal law, you can point to the original um, perpetrator, if you will, of the, of the mess and, and obligate them within a certain amount of time uh, to do the cleanup. But that, party can then point to who bought it and what they knew when they bought it. And by all indications, during our purchase in the late 80s, 
we were not buying a pig and a poke. We, we knew what we were getting into. And so that is a massive amount of litigation that would be required to, to finalize that answer. Who's responsible? So this contract has the value of not only resolving once and for all that Piedmont will do the full cleanup, will indemnify Metro for all of the remediation pre and post. That is a significant value for us just to have that certainty that should there be any obligations to third parties surrounding property owners, for example, we are exculpated from that. That has an enormous value to Metro, and that is beyond the fair market value of the property itself. Thank you. So we're not looking at just the, the market value, but we're looking at a contingent liability that could arise from the transaction. As well as the certainty of it, okay. correct. Thank you. All right, is there any additional discussion on B Bill 2021-743? All those in favor of approving Bill 2021-743, say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Bill 2021-781, Tombs amends the Metro Code relative to medical care benefits for pensioners. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councilman Mendez. Um, can we ask Director Cooper to describe this one for us? Director Cooper. So this bill is the result of a recommendation from the study and formulating committee and from the benefit board to require starting in January of 2023, require all retirees who are eligible for Medicare to transfer to the uh, group Medicare Advantage plan. And the purpose of this is to address Metro's OPEB liability, which is the other post-employment benefits that your retiree health coverage, vision, dental, drug, um, all those benefits that retirees receive. Right now, our unfunded OPEB liability is about $4.3 billion. This would reduce that by roughly, I think it's $1.1 billion. So it, it would, it's a significant reduction in our OPEB liability. The reason that's important is because bond rating agencies look to your OPEB liability when evaluating your credit worthiness and reducing our OPEB liability is, is important for future bond ratings and, and the interest rates that we pay on, on future debt service. Um, according to Metro HR, this would actually save retirees money. Their premiums would be, monthly premiums, premiums would be reduced significantly. Um, currently, about 40% of retirees are, are voluntarily on this plan. Um, and so this would require that the remaining 60%, at least those who are eligible for Medicare, uh, transfer over to this new plan. Um, it's also anticipated that virtually everyone will be able to keep their same medical providers. They will not have to change their existing doctors. 98% um, definitely will not be able to. The other 2% probably will not have to if their doctors agree to bill um, Metro's insurer directly. So if you weigh the benefits for reducing Metro's OPEB liability against the change, the relatively nominal change we've been told that uh, Metro retirees will experience that in, in the long run, it's in Metro's financial best interest. Thanks, Mr. Cooper. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, HR has provided the information about um, how uh, retirees are protected and, and still have their benefits. Um, I want to, um, I guess, just comment for a minute or two about the OPEB obligation. Um, for those of us who've been in office 
um, since 2015. When we got in office, the OPEB obligation was stated on the financials as under $3 billion. It was around $2.8, $2.9 billion as recently as 2015. And the OPEB obligation has been growing faster than the metropolitan budget has been growing for a number of years, which is obviously facially unsustainable in the long run. And so even with this $1.1 billion savings, um, the OPEB obligation comes down um, to still be a higher number than it was when we took office in 2015. Now, there's been an accounting rule change in uh, in the middle of that, um, but even after you adjust for the accounting rule change, um, th this still basically puts the number somewhere in the vicinity of a little bit north of where it was as recently as 2015. So I'm, I'm glad that the study and formulating committee um, was able to make a recommendation that helps bring this down. Um, for folks who aren't term limited, um, you know, the study and formulating committee is going to come around sometime again in the middle of the next term, and hopefully um, they can take another pass at trying to reduce this obligation further um, because it, it, it still has continued to be um, when it grows faster than the metro budget, um, it's, it's inherently unsustainable. And the line that we have to not cross, hopefully, is to make enough changes so one day there's not some group of council members that have to go tell retirees or current employees that um, we're moving the ball on them and changing what their benefits are. And if we manage to wait long enough without addressing the remaining three point some billion dollars, one day this body will have to do that. Um, uh, I'll be out of office. Um, some of you might not be uh, by that time. So I hope we keep working on this. I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're doing this. I'm looking forward to at least taking the $1.1 billion bite out of this. Thank you. Councilwoman Suara. Thank you. I'm in agreement with Councilmember Mendez. But I wanted to point out for, for everyone's sake that this is a, a balance sheet entry. There's no cash involved because when you hear one point some one billion savings for people not to think that we have one billion to put into the budget. Uh, I just want to make sure that we clarify that. <laughs> and and, and uh, Director Crumble can speak to that. But uh, when you hear of that big saving, people can start thinking, yeah, let's take it out of something or reduce taxes or something like that. Uh, it is an adjustment to a liability. There is no cash involved. Thank you. Director Farnbo. Yeah, thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. So uh, let me provide a little clarity here. So um, uh, everything that uh, Director Cooper said, Councilman Mendez, Council Suar, they're all correct. Um, this is a very complicated area of accounting and finance, but uh, the simple way to think of it is today you've got more than $4 billion in future medical costs for retirees, and that's the present value of those dollars today. Councilman Mendez mentioned earlier an accounting rule change, and what that uh, rule change did is it required uh, organizations like this to record the entire amount of the liability and present value dollars and put it all on the balance sheet, even though it may not be due uh, in large part for many, many, many years to come. Uh, Councilman Mendez is correct, though, that the amount of that liability continues to grow as more folks go on to the plan and the eligibility rules change and so forth. Uh, what has really happened here is the study and formulating committee, uh, which goes through the employee benefits board. Uh, I'm seated on that board by virtue of position, as is Shannon Hall. Uh, we've worked for several months with the other representatives there, the study and formula committee, uh, some of you here in the council, the mayor's office, and what we've determined is that we can move many of these beneficiaries that are eligible for this Medicare Advantage plan to that plan with hardly any change at all in uh, the benefits that they receive today. They keep their same providers and so forth. There's a small portion of that population that may be impacted by that, but um, all the folks involved have debated that, and this is truly in the best interest of most all of them. Uh, most will see a reduction in the premiums that they have, which is great uh, for them. Uh, we certainly will see more than a billion dollars come off of our balance sheet. And uh, quite frankly, despite all the sharp elbows I'm sure will be thrown before we're finally done with this budget, hopefully tomorrow night and so forth, this will be the single largest, I'm sorry, single largest financial move that we can make as a metro government. It is a $1 billion change. And when you think of all the stakeholders and all the contributors that have made this financial restructuring possible, this will be a, essentially a billion-dollar contribution by all of those that are on the plan today. 
okay, as well as those that may roll onto it. And that is uh, a fabulous thing for all the obvious reasons, but uh, I really want to compliment Councilman Mendez uh, to say that the remainder of that liability is going to require some management in the future. Um, it's quite manageable the way that it is today, but the growth of that uh, due to medical costs, folks rolling on and off the plan, um, that, that is going to require attention for a long time to come. So hopefully that gives you some clarity uh, of all the issues, and uh, I hope you really will cast your vote for this. It's going to be the biggest financial move uh, that we'll make. Thank you. All right. I have Councilman Sledge, then Councilman Young. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question as far as the function of this. I'm a little unclear as to how this affects dependents for, for employees who are on this. So if you are, if you become eligible for Medicare and you get moved on to Medicare Advantage, how, if at all, and, and you have dependents, are, do they also go on the Medicare Advantage plan, or how are they continued to be yeah, covered? Yeah, I think it is for pensioner and um, dependents. Shannon Hall is coming to the mic. Uh, that mic is Honor, terrible. Yell. yell. <laughs> um, so it is, obviously, we have pensioners that are Medicare eligible and those that aren't including dependents. This change would only impact people who are Medicare eligible and all dependents are Medicare eligible. So those that have um, a dependent child, a spouse who's not Medicare eligible, they would still have their choice of plans between the PPO and the choice fund because they're not eligible for a Medicare Advantage plan. And that plan can take advantage of really rich federal subsidies, unlike the same kinds of subsidies that we actually tirelessly pursue, and we recover millions of dollars every year, but just it can't be as much as the federal subsidies on a Medicare Advantage plan. So this would only impact those pensioners who are on Medicare and every dependent of theirs is on Medicare. But until that time, they would have their choice of plans, PPO or choice fund, or the other options. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That, that's helpful. And, and the other, I guess, functioning question, and this may be a question for Ms. Hall as well, in the little that I've been able to sort of gather, because I don't think many, from what I can tell from my research, and I will be quite honest, it seems that on the employee side, we haven't gotten much research at all, um, that Part B seems to be a sort of pivotal part of this. Can Ms. Hall speak to maybe how those Part B benefits change? Absolutely. So for decades, Metro has required all pensioners who are eligible to take Parts A and B only. As many of you know, there are other parts of Medicare that typically will cost more money. We do not have our pensioners take Part C, D, et cetera. D's are drug coverage that went right. to effect about 20 years ago. So every, every, I'm sorry. Is this better at all? Okay, great. Um, so we have required for decades in order to help mitigate part of the liability with regard to our medical cost, part, taking parts A and B. And so that is true for every pensioner and their dependent. That is true of council members that continue on on this coverage. That will be true of employees like myself that will advance to the plan at that time. So they take part A and B now, and that would be the same. That's all that they would need. The Medicare Advantage plan will actually administer the A and B portions and other wraparound portions. This is a platinum level plan. It's metro customized. It is not a commercial plan like you would buy in the exchange. So we determine the parameters, the Employee Benefit Board, and we have developed a very customized Medicare Advantage plan that's very rich in benefits. And so the Medicare Advantage plan is like one card, one stop, and they administer A, B, drug coverage, and other wraparound coverages. Got it. Okay, I think that, I think that answers the functional pieces of what I was trying to get to. I would like to ask the administration because if I feel like in the cursory research that I've tried to do, and maybe Ms. Holt knows as well, are there other municipalities, the one that has stood out right now, I guess, in public debate is New York, but are there similar size per municipalities to Nashville that have made this move? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, and you probably have probably heard or at least seen over the years that many, because this accounting change, this government accounting standards change, this OPEB change happened in 2008, that most municipalities and state public private, no, I mean, public employers, but at the state and the city level, all had this same change happen to them. 
And some of them have not been positioned to recover in a way. And some of them, as you have heard, have either reduced or eliminated retiree health care. That is something that we are avoiding at all costs, which is part of the reason why we started looking for solutions, because we figured if we can find good, low-hanging fruit solutions that help preserve the same level of benefit our pensioners have become accustomed to, that could be the win-win-win. We can reduce the liability. We can reduce the cost to the pensioner. In this case, reduce the cost to Metro, because Metro pays currently 75% of that premium. So it's a win-win-win. Many other cities have adopted this strategy very successfully. So I think the estimate is that in by 2050, half? By 2050, half of the entire U.S. population that's Medicare eligible will be on a Medicare Advantage plan. Right now, I think it's close to 30 percent. But many other municipalities and states have done this, or some of them, and a lot of this was presented to the Study and Formulating Committee, especially with regard to our peer cities. Um, many have reduced or eliminated benefits, and that is something we are trying to avoid at all costs. Thank you, Ms. Holt. Thank you, Chair. That's all I had. Councilman Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, excuse my ignorance about some of the Medicare things. I've uh, not quite ever shopped for Medicare before. Um, I guess I'm having, how, how do we have these significant savings if, if there's really no change in benefit to the employee? It's just a change in the, the plan. Um, I, I'm, I'm having trouble grasping that because, um, I mean, I'm certainly he hesitant to want to remove choice for uh, pensioners. However, this does sound like it is an incredible product and plan, but I guess I'm concerned in, in the future, will it still be as rich of benefits and how are those, I, I guess I need a little more help on understanding the math of how, how this is going to reduce that liability by a billion dollars, but yet it's not reducing the benefits for the employee. It just doesn't, because I don't think we're, you know, it's not like we've got a smart card or a coupon that's going to save it for us. Right. I mentioned part of it before, but I think um, if I'm sitting in your shoes, the way I'd also explain it is, so the Metro's uh, PPO plan and choice fund are self-insured plans. It means Metro insures the benefit, we own the plan. It also means that if we have a savings one year, we get to keep those premium dollars and help defer the costs, help to mitigate that rising medical inflation for our plans. If we have a bad year, it means that those rates go up, so we have to absorb that rate. With the Medicare Advantage plan, the one that Metro's offering, it is a plan that is designed by the Employee Benefit Board, so we determine the parameters when we bid it. The benefit of using this vehicle is that that shifts it to the insurer, which is fully insured. That's what takes that liability, that OPEB liability, off the books. So when we shift them off of the self-insured plan from a liability perspective, we shift the liability to that Medicare Advantage. So that would be an important part that I didn't mention before. The other part is that one, the Choice Fund and the PPO plan are some of the richest plans for all of our public sector peers. We have some of the richest medical plans around. Um, so these are the same plans that those pensioners are participating in. So those rates are going to be a little bit higher. The other part of it, though, is that on the Medicare Advantage plan, they can take advantage of federal subsidies in a deeper and different way than Metro can just taking the Medicare A and B, like for example, and these are probably terms that you won't care about, but uh, a retiree drug subsidy on one of our plans. We apply for and go through extensive efforts to recover money in that way. We had an employer group waiver plan that was combined with our PPO plan for those that were post 65 in Medicare. That allowed us and there was extensive effort and those would help us to recover a few million dollars a year. But the kinds of, because Medicare Advantage plans are regulated by the federal government. They can take advantage of much deeper federal subsidies and discounts, unlike our plan. And that's what, so that's kind of the delta between how is this a rich plan but still a lower cost, but ours right. are higher? Kind of a combination of those two. And I guess just to make sure I understand this crystal clear, if I'm a pensioner and I now switch to that Advantage plan, the cost I have when I go to the doctor 
and get my prescriptions and everything is not going to increase one penny. Is that? For all the coverage levels, we can't see that. In fact, when we've been, so, and if you go on our website, I'm happy to share this with council members, but it's readily on our website. We have a plan comparison chart that shows you by category kind of what your liability would be if you went to the emergency room, if you went to an office visit. And we have it side by side for all three plans, and it really helps to demonstrate that. That's been one of the biggest satisfaction rates, and frankly, as we've increased our education efforts on this plan, why we've had so many more pensioners starting to go and we've been increasing our enrollment there is because when they get here, they said, gosh, I'm really saving a lot more money than I ever thought I did. But the fear of change is hard for sure. anybody, especially on medical insurance, and especially when we've got long-term employees that have worked here. I mean, I'm approaching 20 years, and I've been on the same plan for years. If it isn't broke, you usually don't fix it, right? But this will actually help to increase the take-home pay in someone's pension check, reduce their cost, and no level of benefit. And because these individuals are already Medicare primary, they have to take Medicare assignment just like the Medicare Advantage. And that's why it's so unique that they're really not going to lose their choice of doctors in almost all situations. So you would have no qualms when you retire being on the Medicare Advantage plan? This is 100% going to apply to me. Right. It's going to apply to anybody on here, council that takes the benefits with them when they leave office. This will apply to you all as well. It applies to everyone. In fact, Part of the reason why I'm doing this is to help ensure that the people like me who still have a pretty long career ahead of me and those behind us have access to quality retiree health care when they get there. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. I have Councilwoman Porterfield, then Councilman Parker, then Councilwoman Murphy. Hold on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilmember Sledge uh, covered my question. Thank you. Councilman Parker. Um, thank you, Chair, for recognition, even though I'm not a member of this committee. Um, I just had a question, uh, perhaps for um, Director Hall. So, so you've mentioned the federal subsidies that are currently in place for these Medicare Advantage plans as well. These are, these are administered by private companies. Um, so if, what would happen if in the future those federal subsidies were reduced to a degree that, say, the private insurance companies that provide these plans, you know, it was no longer viable um, for them to continue doing so. Is there any kind of like vesting or, or like something that guarantees that, you know, this, that if the market takes a turn and says this is no longer viable for us, that, that Metro employees would still have access to that level of retiree benefit? That's what we're trying to do with this move. And I don't know, I will say it's hard to speculate what will happen in the future. But the federal government's estimation for these programs is that they're only going to increase and that half of the whole entire post-65 population in the United States will be on these in the next 20 years, which I think kind of affirms kind of their commitment to it. But I think the short answer is, if things changed, just like they've kind of increased our liabilities, increased our costs, and our, our medical plan inflation is a little lower than the normal plan inflation. We're, we're doing pretty good with regard to our plan experience. I think the short answer is we should evaluate new options and take them to the study and formulating committee and then bring them here. The goal is to continue to improve and preserve the level of benefits when a lot of our peers can. So this, we, we would be able to, I mean, this could theoretically be changed if it turned out to not be supported by the market anymore or if it was not working. Yes, but I think all indications from the federal government is that that's not going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years, which I think gives us some commitment. But I think to your point, I think if things did change and we were not providing the level of benefit that our pensioners need, that we should adopt and change that and we would totally start the same exact process and propose new solutions with Deloitte and our other partners here at Metro. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Director Crumbo. Thank you once again. I um, want to provide a little clarity on uh, two of the council questions that have been asked here. And when I do that, I want you to 
think about my comments being very constructive, but in the negative of some of the things that are being asked here. So uh, let me start with the first one here. You know, in terms of the consensus around this and who is on this Employee Benefits Board and how this really came forward, um, it's a big board. Uh, it includes Dr. Stephanie Bailey, who I know is known to most of you. Uh, it includes representatives from public schools, from the police, from the fire, uh, and so forth. And if they didn't believe that this was in their best interest, I don't think we would have a seat in the House here available. This has been well thought out. I think the beneficiaries there have been well representative, I'm sorry, represented, and I really just don't see any change really coming uh, to that vast majority of folks that we're talking about here. So I hope that brings you some comfort. Uh, the other thing for Councilman uh, Parker, and, and thank you for your question, uh, when we think about what the future holds, nobody really knows that for sure. Uh, we really don't know the future of Medicare, right? That's That's been a question for most of my, my life. Um, but I do know this. This government can't pay for it. We can't pay for $4 billion in liability. Uh, that would require a tax increase that would make the one that we just did last year seem like a rounding error. So I know that future. This is a great first step in chipping away at this plus $4 billion liability. And as I mentioned before, Council Mendez is right. We're going to need to manage that, that other three. That doesn't mean we need to cut it or do anything draconian or make any threats about that. But what it does do is put us on parity with a lot of other cities that have been able to trim back their, uh, their liabilities in this regard. So uh, when Shannon was talking earlier about the work of the committee and the comparable cities, uh, we actually looked at a, a chart, a rather lengthy chart, of all the cities that have made these sort of changes. And on the one hand, you would look at it and say, some of them cut it all together, and that sounds terrible, and that's the story. But the other story is, is that they're economically more competitive than we are at this moment. So if I look down the road and think, what are we going to compete for? If we're going to compete for a new business like Oracle, which we spent so much time on, we need to be competitive as well. So this gets us a billion dollars to the good here. It comes with a great deal of consensus uh, for all the constituents that are involved. And again, I would urge you to vote for it. It will be the singles, I'm sorry, single largest dollar amount that you will change in this term. Thank you. Councilwoman Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for letting me speak when I'm not on the committee. Um, I have a few questions about this. Um, well, I have lots of questions about this. Let me make that clear. I am concerned that this is coming to us at a time when we've been very involved with budget issues and other issues. Um, and I think that this is a very serious change that we're making. And while there are a lot of arguments for it being presented here tonight, I don't think that we've had the time as a council to really look at this and investigate it. And I wish that the administration had given us more times to really consider this, given the impact, not just to our fiscal responsibility, but the impact to, to our, our retirees and, and upcoming employees who are retiring. So what is the timing of this to go into effect? When will, when will our retirees change over? So the proposed change is for January 2023. And the reason why this is being presented now is because we need to be thoughtful about how we bid this through the RFP. This is the single largest RFP that we do in Metro HR. And the plans that we administer are $200 million plans a year. While they're self-insured, they're really big business. So we want to get it right. This needs to be properly reflected in that RFP so that we can properly administer that. And that RFP process has to start by the end of the summer in order for us to implement plans I know that sounds crazy, a year and a half later. We also want to make sure we're really thoughtful about our communication and implementation effort with all affected parties, those that currently would make the change, and that those that would be upcoming on the change. So we want to have plenty of time to communicate, but really the long and short is in order to accommodate the required procurement process for the medical. So, so since we have not bid this out and the RFP has not gone out, I am concerned about the guarantees that we are making to our employees and what we are discussing here tonight and saying that we feel good that our retirees are the premiums are going to go down, um, that they're not going to have to change their, their health care providers and things like that. Well, that is the case for the current um, option that we have for retirees, I'm concerned that if we haven't even done the RFP and bid that out, how can we make those guarantees now? to us as a council body and to the employees this is going to reflect or impact, I'm sorry. So as I mentioned before, this is not a commercial plan. This is not a street plan. We determine the parameters. 
We say these are the level playing field. This is how you're going to administer it. And it's just an insurer that comes in and administers that benefit. So if they're not willing to administer our provisions, they're not considered as part of the insurer population. What if we can't find a, a group that will insure it with the guarantees you've given us tonight? They've, we've had no problem doing that in the past 20 years, and we haven't changed any of the level of benefits. And in fact, I would argue that the satisfaction with our current administrator is very high. We actually just got access to the 2022 rates from the fully insured. It's actually going to make the savings more next year than they are this year. I think I communicated that to you in writing. So if we've had... I think your, your handout said that like 40% of our current retirees have made this change, have started moving in this direction already, and that many of them reflect, and what you've said here today was that their premiums go down, therefore their take-home pensioner check is greater. Why are we not maybe phasing this in and doing more education instead of forcing and taking away that choice for retirees to, to transfer over? We've been doing increased education efforts now for, I would say, five or six years. And that's what has allowed us to move the needle even further in this participation for these plans. Um, but really, it's the RFP process that we need to make sure we can accommodate. I personally think that we would have to face tougher choices in the next five to six years, which because most of our plans okay. will go for five years. And I don't want to fear what the other options could be because reducing and eliminating benefits is not something I'm interested in. So I think what I had missed when, when I've looked at this before is that it only, as, as I think Councilman Sledge was putting out, that this is only going to affect our retirees that are only Medicaid eligible. So do you have numbers? I guess the numbers that were given to us, I had assumed that was all of our pensioners, so it was not. So can you tell us how many pensioners this will if that we are taking the choice away from as opposed to the retirees that will still be having the choice of plans? Yes, I can totally email you those numbers. Can it's, you email them to the whole council? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, I think it's more than, I think there are more post-65 pensioners than pre-65 pensioners, but I'll email both of those. Okay. Um, you know, I think that I would feel more comfortable with this if it was something that was phased in, if it was something that was applying to future retirees, rather than us making this decision for our retirees who've already retired, who have already made some choices, that they still have the choice to make it now. Um, I'm concerned that we're kind of treating different retirees differently. So if you don't have a beneficiary or, you, you know, you don't have a spouse or a child still on the plan, we're making that decision for you. And I always think that, um, you know, when, when given a choice and when given, when it comes to healthcare providers and your healthcare insurance, I think that choice is best made by the individual with the guidance of the HR department rather than the council making that decision for them. Um, I'm concerned that we are discussing that there's no uh, cash impact necessarily, right? Like we heard uh, uh, Mr. Crumbo and, and Council Lady Sarar speak to that there's not uh, necessarily, like, we're not going to have this money that we can go running to put into other projects. But then we're also told by uh, Mr. Crumbo and the administration that if we don't do this, then we're going to have to potentially raise taxes greatly. I would love to see that fleshed out and demonstrated not just to us more so we can have a better understanding, but to the public and to the pensioners that are going to be impacted by this. And so, again, I just raise the concern that we are making a choice for our retirees about their health care benefits, and we are not having a whole lot of discussion um, about it at a time that we can really look into this. We have a lot of issues in front of us right now, and I have concerns that it is just popping us, popping up today. Um, and I would love for us to have heard from more of the retirees about this. Um, I, it wasn't a unanimous vote at the, the benefits board, and I think that speaks to us that we, we should be looking at this more closely. It, I think that it may be the right decision for us to move into, but I would feel comfortable if we had more time to really do our due diligence on this. Um, so thank you, Chair. Councilwoman Swar. Thank you. I just want to provide a clarification. Uh, doing the one billion does help our bottom line. It's going to be in our fund balance. It makes us look better. It helps the credit rating. Uh, the reason why I made that clarification about cash is that I didn't want people to start thinking that you know it's 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 money in the bank. So, but when you're looking at your financial statements, you're looking at how much debt you owe. It always affects your bottom line. And if you have more debt, 
then your fund balance is lower. So I want to make that clarification that I'm not saying that it doesn't help. It's a tremendous help to our financial statements and to our credit rating. So it does help on that stand. But uh, I know from being on this council that, and I do it too, anytime I hear savings, you know, I think in terms of where can I spend that money? And so that's why I was making that distinction uh, between, between that. So I just wanted to clarify that. All right, any additional discussion on Bill 2021-781? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Oh, oh I'm sorry. An abstention. Are you an abstention, Councilman Virtue? Okay. Any other abstentions? All right, moving on to bills on third reading, Bill 2021-736, Tombs adopts the budget ordinance of the Metro Government of Nashville and Davidson County, Tennessee for fiscal year 2022. Um, move to substitute the bill to the amendment. Yes, so you'll need to actually have it. Tomorrow night you'll have a vote on this. You can do it all at once if you want. Okay. Do it all at once, right? Well, Okay, gotcha. That's what's on. Okay. All right. Uh, Bill 2021 736. Um, there is a, a substitute. Can I get a motion to move the substitute? It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the substitute. There are several um, amendments, including a late filed amendment. We'll just go in order. Uh, proposed amendment number one Councilman O'Connell, Mendez, and Henderson. Yes. I think we do the amendments. Director so, Cooper just said I can do it in any so, order. <laughs> since, <laughs> since we're in committee, it's okay to have the have it all during the discussion of the substitute. Tomorrow night, you'll have the vote to accept the substitute, and then amendments can be offered. All right. So amendment one is Councilman O'Connell, Mendez, and Henderson. Councilman O'Connell, let me find you. You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't, I don't have the budget book. I think this is the. Is this the one about the pilot? Yes. 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 Um, so, thank you. This is a great follow-up to a tough discussion we've had over the past couple of years. As council members will know, uh, many of us, especially those serving last term, were in the dark for a number of years about some. Uh, difficulties with finances at Metro Water. Uh, we. When this came to light, we knew that we had to make a pretty significant adjustment to our water rates. Um, in looking at that, I think like many members of council, I was focused on the rate structure and making sure that would sustain us. That happened simultaneously with uh, a corrective action plan required by the state comptroller's office. In putting that together, uh, a pilot was established for Metro Water uh, in addition, a uh, $10 million in addition to an existing $4 million pilot, um, you know, I felt like as water rates continued to increase, and I was hearing from uh, my constituents about this, I wanted a solution that would make sense to them um, in terms of why the rates were going up. The part that was hardest to explain was why a one-time corrective action plan measure uh, was then persisting as this pilot uh, year over year, putting further upward pressure on water rates. Uh, I understand the administration's perspective on this, um, and I think where we are headed to is this amendment, uh, which gives us an opportunity to do an analysis of all of these outstanding pilots with Nashville Electric, Music City uh, Center, uh, Metro Water, and hopefully gives both the mayor's office and this council, as well as the general public, a an opportunity to think strategically about when we have large land holdings that are not otherwise contributing to the property tax base, how should we do that? What are the kinds of investments we should expect to be making on the basis of that? Uh, what is the impact on ratepayers, et cetera? So I encourage colleagues to support this amendment. I, I'd consider it a good collaboration between uh, council and the finance department and mayor's office. Thank you. Councilman Mendez. Thanks. Um, so I, I signed on to this, um, and I, I guess I want to um, give my thoughts about it because my motivation is um, somewhat different than Councilman O'Connell's in that I'm not really bothered by what we did with the water department a year ago really at all. 
Um, from my perspective, when I was on the audit committee last term, one of the things I worked on was trying to get the annual audit to capture um, the sum total of economic development dollars um, that get spent in slightly different ways all in one place. And sure, it's buried in the audit, but it's at least mostly together in one place. One thing that um, never really still to this day isn't captured anywhere is how much in property tax dollars um, we're supposedly not collecting um, from pilots. And since there's a bunch of different flavors of pilots uh, that are not all created equal, um, some are for affordable housing, some are the ones that uh, Councilman O'Connell mentioned, um, there's really not a one-stop one shopping somewhere where somebody can figure out um, the total amount of uh, payments in lieu of taxes in the metro government. And, and so my interest is trying to um, get that captured uh, in one place, because um, I think it'll facilitate a conversation about which ones are good ones and which ones are maybe um, need improvement. One thing I, I think uh, uh, I told, uh, I've told Councilman O'Connell this, and just so I repeat in front of everybody, um, you know, you got to uh, watch out what you wish for here. Um, you know, it could come out that some of the biggest pilots, the answer is, gee, that number's kind of random. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and some of them might go up, some of them might go down um, if we try to get it um, all to, to be the, the same way. In particular, I think uh, NES is a giant taxpayer in the form of a pilot. And uh, I think there's a decent chance that we find out that theirs is overstated compared to some of the other ones. So I just want to watch out. We should know what we're asking for here by doing a study on this. Um, and uh, again, just because my motivation is a little bit different than Councilman O'Connell's, I wanted to say what was on my mind. Thanks. All right. Any other discussion on Amendment 1? All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, moving on to Amendment 2, Councilman O'Connell and Murphy. Councilman O'Connell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and again, thank you for the recognition. I know um, that that amendment to me is kind of a, just a basic good government amendment. This one, first let me say credit to the Mayor's Office, your work, this committee's work, uh, in putting together a budget that I think is going to pass uh, effectively on consent tomorrow night. Uh, the one concern I had in looking at the overall budget in terms of something that motivated me to file a, a substantial amendment is, is really the reason I ran for council in the first place. I, I came here directly after seven years of service on the Nashville MTA Board of Directors uh, working to try to attack the problem of transit in Nashville where we have made inadequate investments. I think most people would agree. Any any native Nashvillians, but certainly those people coming to Nashville from other markets would, would recognize that we have not invested at a level uh, commensurate with our growth. Um, what I have put on your desks uh, is a letter detailing my uh, thinking on this that includes actually a letter from MTA to uh, the previous administration uh, with three specific tiers that is broken out by three specific fiscal years uh, with a variety of investments we could make with local funding levels, right? This is the kind of investment in transit you might make even if you didn't have a dedicated funding source. We are, frankly, woefully behind on making these investments. Last fall, we passed a $1.6 billion transportation plan. We approved it. It was not a funded plan. We heard about opportunistic funding. We subsequently saw a $475 million capital spending plan that had almost no investment in transit. This operating budget restored funding that was cut during COVID, uh, but did not allow us to make the type of investment we need to make. Meanwhile, we've got a public works department that if, if we ask for a show of hands in this room about who's basic issues of service, including those that are part of transition, namely trash pickup, where I've had more complaints about trash pickup in the past six weeks than I have in the past six years. Uh, if we talk about infrastructure delivery, where I know Council Member Sledge and I share a variety of corridors, we have just watched in the past few weeks projects that are grinding in the gears at Public Works, the department we are trying to transform into a Department of Transportation, uh, are 
now stalled for another year with an entire new design team on them when a community-based design was already approved. We are struggling to get to ground. I'm six years into waiting for 900 linear feet of sidewalk. And what I want is a demonstration that leadership and management are coming in to affect with a permanent director so that we can ask for this full 42-person investment next year after we take 1.1 million and put it into WeGo's service delivery. You can see on this menu, even if WeGo did not ask for this, and I say this from the perspective of someone who helped design their operating and strategic plan, which is still in effect, in motion, back in 2015, they will know what to do with it. So I encourage colleagues to support this. I know the administration has suggested I did not talk to WeGo. That is, in fact, not true. I did discuss this amendment with WeGo, uh, and the administration, I think, is well aware of my concerns about the level of investment. I'm okay to disagree about the priorities. This is my expression of the priorities that I want to pursue. Encourage colleagues to support on committee. Thank you. Before we uh, move on to additional discussion, can I get a motion to get the amendment in front of the committee? All right, it's been properly moved and seconded to approve amendment number two. Councilman Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I am a couple questions that and I don't know if they are best answered. Uh, well, whoever wants to answer, I guess they can have their, their chance. Um, the positions that are currently in the budget, the 42 being created at, at uh, what we've been referring to as NDOT, um, what we, the way we have funded them in the budget, are we funding them as if they are going to be hired and ready to go July 1 to June 30th? Um, because if so, we all know that all 42 positions are not going to be filled on July 1. and. Um, I would ex ex anticipate, and maybe there's some guidance the administration um, can can share. Um, I would think, especially with as, as specialized as some of these positions are, they're not going to be filled in one month or maybe two or three months. So um, I can't help but wonder by removing 1.1 million dollars and shifting it to WeGo, is it necessarily putting um, the 20 positions completely in jeopardy since um, fully funding those positions for the year is going to be too much money, if, if that's making sense. So um, maybe the administration can shed some light on kind of path I'm headed down. Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Young. Um, I should preface all these comments by saying uh, Mr. Bland is not here today. We've had email discussions, uh, and I will share with the Council what he has commented about uh, an amendment that at least by his communications today insists he has not seen, has never seen. Um, but in his place, we have with us today Ed Oliphant, who's back here with you, uh, uh, CFO from WeGo, as well as Rita Roberts-Turner, the Chief Administration Officer. Also, uh, Faye DeMassimo here with me um, from the Mayor's Office. Uh, Shanna Whitelaw is also out. But none of those individuals had seen this amendment until today. And I want to commend the council members, the majority of whom who had amendments that approached the administration to the extent there were any disagreements or can we collaborate on, on how this should, should go forward? Where can we both uh, reach a mutually agreeable version? We did that in 90% in of the amendments and I think it's tomorrow night could be one of the smoothest budgeting uh, adoptions that I've seen. But this amendment is going to cut by nearly half the 42 allotted positions. And if you will recall, during the Public Works budget hearings, there were specific questions submitted by the council members in advance, itemize the positions, justify what they do, and allocate how they will go forward starting July 1st. You're absolutely right. They're not going to have 42 starting the morning of July 2nd. But if we don't allocate the funding now and we have to wait a year for that, you can, you can build a tennis court, but if you're going to allot one player to it, it's not going to do you much good to have done the tennis court. By the capital spending plan that this council overwhelmingly adopted, after overwhelmingly adopting a transportation plan in December, you allotted 20 times the capital items for the new DOT as you did for WeGo. That has staffing implications, and Steve Bland will tell you unequivocally 
that these dollars are more appropriately and more urgently needed by the DOT than his department. Let me repeat that in case there is any uncertainty. The director, Steve Bland, will tell you that these monies are more appropriately spent, kept where they are in the proposed operating budget for the establishment of an effective DOT rather than the WEGO department. Whose department is eligible for the CARES Act and the IRP funding uh, forthcoming to further substantiate the, the, the bus service, uh, the better bus service? The calculation of 42, you will remember that you tasked Ms. DeMassimo with conservatively estimating what minimum number of people are needed to effectively get the DOT off the ground. And there were concerns that it would be overinflated by this council, and 42 was presented to you as the minimum number. I understand Mr. O'Connell was not able to attend that public works meeting that itemized these specific positions. I wish he had. Perhaps it was incumbent upon me to follow up with him to make sure he understood the significance of these positions. I did spend the afternoon going through what I had recalled from Mr. O'Connell's previous posts, passionate posts on the forming of a DOT going back to 2017 and arguing articulately with which we vehemently agreed that he did not want to see a stultified DOT, that he voted against the budget in 2018 because it did not adequately fund a DOT. And the last thing he wanted to see after the December transportation approval was an anemic DOT that was going to suffer further cuts. Well, here we are on the one yard line, ready to go. And to cut this by half without consulting the affected department, without calling Mr. Massimo, without calling Ms. Whitelaw, without calling Mr. Bland, without calling the administration, and just taking a meat cleaver and deciding 50% sounds about right, that is Madam, right. Madam Chair, I asked the administration about positions and the funding of them. I did not ask the administration to take the opportunity to chastise a colleague of mine and to put out attitude. So I was wondering, could we direct the administration to maybe address the question I asked? My apologies, I'm not intending in any way to chastise Mr. O'Connell. I agree with his positions, and I thought this amendment was, was contrary to what I had seen in post. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilman Young, if you don't mind, if you could repeat your question so that we can all be on the same page as to what should be answered. Thank you, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to. The amount of money funded by 1.1 million, or the positions funded with 1.1 million, that's 20 positions, not all of that will be used as budgeted because those positions will not all be filled July 1, and we will not begin paying those salaries. So w what is the, the opportunity that, that there is uh, a way to not remove these positions but still shift money to we go because we're not going to be spending all of that money um and and talk in I, i'm simply so, wanting to have a conversation about some compromise making this work not in whether a colleague has spoken to who and how they vote in the past um i think the administration called a press conference if they want to do that but i'm just here to work on some legislation so, Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilman Young, there are some positions, for example, in the substitute where they are funded starting January 1, 2022. Are you asking if something similar could be done with these positions where it's delayed funding? I, I, that is certainly, I think, something that would be an appropriate answer or appropriate conversation okay. to be had with the line of question I'm trying to have. Okay. Mr. Jameson? Uh, let me defer to Ms. DeMassimo, um, if I can. Ms. DeMassimo? Thank you, Chair. If we, um, a lack of adequate staffing, um, and I want to take just a moment to say this, will make it more difficult for the work of being a truly multimodal DOT. That is all the work that we need to do with WEGO as well. We were very careful in, in crafting those 42 positions, and we've been working very closely already, council member, with HR to make sure we don't have to post 42 positions individually, but some of these positions, and you may recall this from the budget meeting, the, um, remember we gave very specifics on what those exact 42 positions were. Some of those will be, will be able to go in a job classification and be able to hire four people, for example, from one particular classification. We anticipate being able to fill out the organization rather quickly and we have been very purposeful and deliberate about that. 
We think that's really important because a lack of adequate staffing will not only make it more difficult um, to do the work of being a truly multimodal DOT, but our efforts to recruit leadership, if they don't, if they're not able to see that they're coming to an organization that's with a real resource commitment that will be followed through on and that we are making those things happen, it just makes it more difficult. So we are moving forward on those things, you know, putting all the pieces in place with HR even now. Thank you. And, you know, I, I'm hesitant to support the amendment. However, I thought that it was appropriate that uh, we kind of think about this and try and talk through it. But uh, now I'm sort of inclined to support it just to uh, spite the administration with the attitude that was given. But thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the administration's attentiveness to my commentary and voting record for the past few years. They might note that my attentiveness was actually to delivery of transit services and multimodal infrastructure. If you look at what I'm cutting here, I'd be remarkably surprised to learn that WeGo uh, thinks that right-of-way mowing and plow crews, a, another council liaison and community relations position, if anybody's ever attended a public works committee over the past six years knows, they know that no other department sends more staff to council meetings than the Metro Public Works Department. Reviews and records, these are not the positions. If you look, I was meticulous. I took my own review. It's not like I just picked a number at random. I looked at the positions that were least likely to implement, the, to affect implementation of the Department of Transportation that was actually focused on service delivery. Since we took office in 2015, those of us who started at, at that time, we have watched a constant retreat from funding this. I have constituents who are still wondering what happened to the circulator that used to operate at no fare down Jefferson Street to TSU. That service does not exist. The zero emission vehicles that used to operate that service are no longer in service. This is an opportunity for us to build a new baseline. This is a both and approach. It gets a Department of Transportation off the ground. It also puts service right onto the streets where people can use it who are coming out of a, a dire economic, economic circumstance that we cannot disconnect from Nashville's affordable housing crisis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Massimo, is there a, you spoke generally about um, filling these positions. Do you have a specific timeline as to when you expect to fill all 42? We're working with HR on that timeline now, um, and I can get that to you, but but as I said, some of them are already job classifications and mm -hmm. active recruitments. They're have, like have ongoing started. recruitments okay. that we can go ahead and pull from very quickly. Um, and the the importance of all 42 positions, you know, we again, we were very careful and deliberate, as you recall from our presentations in the budget meetings, about why these 42 positions were really essential to standing up the DOT. And some of the, some of the positions, um, as the council member mentioned about mowing, might not seem as important, but they're very important, for example, from a safety perspective. And all of the positions that are, um, that are committed in here are truly part of us finally achieving a multimodal system that is very important and can partner with WeGo, with MTA, in the way that is absolutely necessary to achieve results. So we, we're deeply committed to MTA and WeGo's success as well and believe that um, the additional funding that needs to be forthcoming um, for them would be something we're going to support and recommend in future cycles. Councilwoman Gamble. Thank you, Chair, uh, for allowing me to speak as I'm not on the Budget and Finance Committee, but I do have a question regarding the funding that will be moved to WeGo. Do we know, there have been several routes and, and services that have been cut over the last two years. Do we know how this funding will impact that? Do we know, is there a process for what this funding will go to to restore? Because it's not enough to restore everything, I'm sure. Do we know and is there a process for what would be restored and how this money would be used? Okay. Councilman O'Connor, do you want to speak to that? I know there are some folks from WeGo in the audience. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And Councilmember Gamble, I, I specifically did not make this allocation with a prescription. That's one of the reasons, um, you know, we are fortunate that WeGo among departments is relatively unique in having a very operable strategic plan, right? So. The, the letter from 2017 
details vary uh, on the ground. You can feel it right now today. Uh, changes. They might choose to pr apply this funding to those categories. They might have other priorities that are there. I know Mr. Jamison suggested in correspondence earlier today that we go would not be able to advance service. That is simply not true. I say that from the perspective of serving not just on the board, but as chair of the board. If they get a million dollars, they will put a million dollars into service that will be uh, available to riders of public transit. We go might have other comments. All right, is there any, Councilwoman Bircher? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want, just for, for clarity, um, before we, where I vote on this. So I'm hearing from the administration that essentially WeGo is indicating they don't need additional dollars. Um, my colleague is indicating that they do need additional dollars. Um, can we have someone from WeGo to be on record today? Because in moving forward as a body, uh, we can take this conversation in moving forward as we determine how to, to fund them in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Come to the um, next to Councilman Stiles, because that back mic doesn't work well. And if you can introduce yourself, yes. Uh, good evening to you all. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Rita Roberts Turner, Chief Administrative Officer for WeGo Public Transit, and thank you for that question, Council Lady. Uh, again, just to be clear, we are certainly appreciative of the budget that the Mayor's Office has proposed. We are appreciative of Councilman O'Connell's um, advocacy for public transit and everyone for us. Uh, but it is important that we make clear on record, we're not saying we don't need money. We're not saying we have absolutely all the money um, that we need. What we are saying is that we understand the priorities of the DOT, what the administration is trying to accomplish in this fiscal year. And because we do have funding, um, and I do have Ed Oliphant here as our chief financial officer, we do have federal funding based on, on the CARES Act, the recovery uh, money, that we can use for this fiscal year to begin to jumpstart our better bus plan. And I think that's somewhat in part what uh, Council Member O'Connell was referencing in terms of the in motion and all the things that we're trying to do with that plan. But we do want to make clear that as the DOT advances, as we're able to advance other initiatives for WeGo Public Transit, we are going to have to come back to this council in years to come and certainly ask for funding to keep those service levels up, to keep the quality of service that we are saying the DOT will provide, that we want to provide through Better Bus at the levels that the city deserves. Hope that answers your question, Council. Madam Chair, this is why it makes it, it difficult for my colleagues to, to try to advocate for resources for, for agencies. And I want to applaud my colleague. I've known him for many years and he's been an advocate unapologetically an advocate for, for transit for every community uh, in this city. As, as many of you know, the city, the city gentrified and the district that, that he represents are, are people that, that, that look like me, and he's taken it upon himself to make sure that uh, people that look like me that he ac actually represent are not left behind in, in this transit conversation. And the, my question wasn't answered because Every department that comes before us, they're going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm grateful for the administration's budget. I'm thankful for the, chairs, for the chair's budget. But for us as legislators, when we're trying to fill that gap and provide them with resources, we need you to be brutally honest with us. Because what you say on record here has, dis, um, has an impact on our decisions as it relates to, you know, fiscal allocations. Now, you're, you're saying, they're, they're saying they're gonna come back to us in the future. What I'm hearing again is that they don't need these dollars right now. Mm -hmm. And as many of us know, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know uh, the stresses that's gonna be on this city uh, uh, next year, um, actually even <laughs> six, six months from now. So, you know, I, I just go back to, this is what makes it really difficult for, for colleagues it, when you go out and put your neck out there and advocate for resources for agencies and, 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 it's, and it's not supported. So, so Madam Chair and my colleagues, this is what I'm gonna do. 
because I agree with my colleague, I don't know how right away mowing and plow crews uh, uh, impact uh, the DLT, uh, the, the council liaison and community relations. Uh, I don't see that hindering us moving forward as it relates with the DLT as well too. And, and I can say this with, with confidence uh, with Councilman O'Connell, he's always very, he doesn't bring a whole lot of legislation, but when he brings it, it's very thoughtful, it's very methodical, and he's done his research. And then I'm a sit down chair, and I, on, on this last comment, colleagues, we are legislators. We don't need the administration's permission when we file legislation, and we don't have to run that legislation by them. So don't let that be uh, a factor in your decision in, porting, in supporting our colleague's amendment because he didn't run his amendment by their office. He's a legislator, you're a legislator, that's what we do. We don't need permission to file legislation because we're charged with being the voice of the people. So with that, uh, for Budget and Finance Chair Committee members, I want you to support Amendment 2. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any... Councilwoman Suara? Thank you, Chair. Um, Director Cooper, if we make this amendment and we support it and it passes, and then come January, we need that 20 position for the Department of Transportation. Can we add money to transportation at that time? Theoretically, you could appropriate money from the undesignated fund balance if adequate funds are still available. That would be the use of one-time money for a recurring purpose, which is frowned upon, but it is legal. So, so when I first saw the amendment, I'm in support of it because I know of a lot of people that talks about not being able to get on the buses and things like that. And I thought, well, we need the 42 employees, but we don't need them immediately. Why don't we tackle immediate need and then add to the employees as we need it? Uh, uh, and, and when we talk transportation, we go and, and people get in on buses is a big part of it. One of the things that folks always talk about is that we need to have more routes and extend the hours. That's what I've always heard when we talk transportation, and especially for people that get on buses, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the need. And, and I know I got an email about routes being cut. Uh, I know some of it is true due to COVID, but there are people that still need the ridership. And so getting the buses, having more frequency, extending the hours are things to me that I think is immediate, uh, uh, I understand we need to fully uh, have a transportation department that works, but looking at the argument that we're not going to have them on, on day one, that's why I'm more inclined uh, logistically to support, let's do what people need, let's do what is needed now, and then build on, on that and give the money later. Now, in terms of we go not needing it or need it or not needing it, I can tell you the people said they want more transportation. That's what I hear. And so that's why that is something that is of urgent need for me. And that's why this makes sense from my perspective. All right, Councilwoman Allen, and I know there's some folks from the administration that want to speak as well. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to join this discussion. I, I appreciate Council Member O'Connell looking for ways to, to, to further fund um, we go, and certainly I have a friend who's had to give up work because she can't get to it because the Midtown bus doesn't run anymore and it just takes too long to go downtown. So th there's certainly plenty of, of examples of uh, being able to do that. I also know that, um, that the, the changes that are happening in the fall are on the, the WeGo website that show uh, that some of the uh, hours are being extended and that there are more frequent buses being put out there. As I, as I listen to this conversation, several questions. One, is it, is it possible um, to find the money somewhere else? Is it possible to use a combination of, we know we won't have people hired until a third of the way through the year and take some of the money from that and then find some other place to make the rest of it up? That's my question. I think that one's more rhetorical, but I would love for somebody to work with me on that one. And then the second one is, if someone could we go, could um, possibly either now or in an email, 
look at the comparison of this uh, strategic plan uh, list that listed items like service reliability initiative would be a $271,000 uh, annual cost and completing the advanced fare collection system would be $400,000 and eliminating the fee transfers would be 2.75 million, but I think that's happening already. And then more frequent transit for 14 of MTA's busiest routes how, how does that list compare with what is being proposed in the fall? Is the is the um, the frequency that is being proposed in the fall cover 14 routes or three routes? And also, if you could talk about how many routes are having the hours extended, because that's another one that has a price tag in it in this letter for um, again 14 of the of the routes. Ms. Roberts Turner. And, and I apologize, Council Lady, I'm not sure which list you're referring to. I'm happy to get information for you about what we've proposed and what our board has looked at in terms of what they want to advance for this first phase of Better Bus. Is that maybe? I think what that's what's, but that's what's up for comment now on the on the Correct. MTA website. Correct. Yes. yes, and what I'm comparing that with is a letter that was sent from MTA in 2017 that lists the tier one, two, three, and four. I see priorities okay. um, and, and specifically addresses some of these things which may be happening already or may, may only be partially happening. Correct. That's what I would like to get a better okay. grip on. All right. I'll be happy to get that to you and the rest of the council. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to respond to Councilmember Allen's question in part two, those uh, kind of biannual service changes that the that WeGo makes are just kind of a part of where we have historically been. The the point in my sending back to colleagues this letter, some of them for the first time, obviously if you were here in 2017, you might have seen this correspondence previously. This was drawn from an in-motion advisory committee so that we could basically prepare for a future and it kind of broke things out by tier. Uh, the point of this letter effectively was that our standard year-over-year -year investment at, to date, to that point, had not allowed for delivery of this multi-tiered approach, right? And so what I'm trying to say is, you know, we need to move faster and further on the transit side than we have demonstrated any interest in doing. So uh, I just wanted to offer that by way of the context for why I provided this letter in particular. Mr. Massimo. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things I just wanted to offer as, as food for thought on this matter. One of the things that we know, we completely agree that we want people to be able to get to transit, to be able to use transit for the transit service to be there. And that's part of the part of what is reflected for sure in the transportation plan that you all approved back in December and that the administration led the development of. And that's why half of it is reflected in transit. But good transit also has to have sidewalks. It also has to have traffic signals that enable it to move because most of our system is bus transit. We still need all of those other pieces of the transit system that are really multimodal. And the new Department of Transportation is the organization that's got to deliver that. And if our ability to deliver that is so impaired, it, we will not be able to see that, that positive result that you also want to see on the WeGo side. We don't look at it really very differently. I know Steve and I work together, um, Mr. Bland and I work together all the time. As a matter of fact, one of the things we're working on right now is what, what would be our next round of budget requests. We know that this round we've really focused on getting that DOT off the ground, getting it ready to deliver the multimodal infrastructure readying it to be a good and positive and reliable partner to WeGo. And if we um, f fail to fulfill those obligations, it's going to impact their operations too. But knowing that we're going to stand up the DOT, knowing that we're going to be moving forward, Steve and I have already been working on them. How do we begin to shift as we properly should to those kinds of things that are very necessary to make sure that exactly what uh, Councilmember O'Connell and others have alluded to is the need for additional resourcing for WeGo, no, no doubt about it. But if we don't have the DOT stood up, if we don't have it adequately resourced, if we've not been able to bring the leadership to it and have the leadership's confidence that coming here means they're going to lead an organization that's moving out. And 42, um, the 42 that we suggested, as you know, I know has, has also been uh, discussed that that was a part of a year's worth of 
evaluation that Director Whitelaw and I undertook of, of the uh, form, about to be former Public Works Department. Um, and one of the things that we did was we borrowed upon the experience um, that we've had in other organizations and in other major metro cities of actually running a DOT. So I think that being able to bring that to this and make sure that we're thinking about it though from a Metro Nashville perspective and that we are engaging those additional positions in a way that are going to support WeGo's success are gonna make sure that our first DOT is also enormously successful and that all of those issues that we hear from you um, and the community all the time about sidewalks, about the traffic signals, about improving safety, all those things that we've got to be moving those out to or we won't have a fully successful system. So thank you. And Madam Chair, if I could hand the microphone to Ms. Wilson, who just wanted to add a, a point about the, the median and right-of-ways, but to answer Council Lady Allen's question, we think there absolutely may be other funding sources that are possible other than making transportation a zero-sum game. And if the sponsor would entertain a discussion with us later this evening or first thing in the morning, if we can give the, be given the chance to identify other funding sources that might not feed upon transportation as a whole, I think that'd be a win-win. Let me hand it to Ms. Wilson. Ms. Wilson, and then I'll go back to you, Councilman O'Connor. Just thank you. I mean, I think one of the jobs we have is to establish the impacts operationally of any of these proposals and to communicate them to you and make sure you're aware of those. And we'll take this further and digest it further. But one thing that immediately hit me upon hearing the discussion of the median and mowing uh, roles is uh, in the past, we've relied on the sheriff's office to help us with that. And if you all will refer to the budget, we took a million dollars out of the sheriff's um, baseline operational budget. And so I am very worried about our ability to actually fulfill those duties um, at this point in time. Now we'll work it further and try to understand if we have to jiggle crews around, if it means that other things don't happen in the, um, uh, in the new DOT, we'll work through thinking that through, but I wanna be clear to you that when you all think that that maybe isn't something that we could figure out or that is minor, you will have some impacts here that we'll articulate back to you. Um, at this point in time, I don't know how we would take care of getting the medians mode across all of a Metro uh, on any regular schedule. And snow plow routes as well, thank you, Faye. Councilwoman Porterfield, did you still want to speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, two questions here, um, and thank you for the sponsor for all his hard work on this. I know Councilman O'Connor has always been very um, passionate and adamant about addressing transit issues and equity issues, so thank you so much, Councilmember O'Connor. Um, my question is, with the funding that we are looking to receive with the, um, I think it's the American Rescue Plan. Is it, did I get it right? I keep, I keep getting those letters mixed That's up. Right. But are we anticipating any additional funding that could help support um, the DLT so that if this does pass and, and we give the additional funding to um, WeGo, are we anticipating any additional funding that can help supplement the DLT? Ms. Wilson or Ms. DeMassimo or Ms. Wiggins? Uh, I think Mary Jo's quickly looking at this for the American Rescue Plan for the local fund dollars that come our way. Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll get to you in just a moment. In the meantime, um, MTA, RTA, I believe, has over um, $40 million coming through the American Rescue Plan on top of the $9.8 million balance they still have on the CARES Act side. But um, let me uh, hand this back over to uh, Mary Jo. Uh, well, a follow-up on that point then, do we know when, the, when we could see actual uh, service improvements from the funding that you're saying WeGo will be getting? I would ask for somebody from WeGo to answer that. I just wanted to confirm it is $48 million for, F, for MTA. So it's, it's 48 plus the 9.8 that they have from the CARES Act? Okay. Ms. Roberts-Turner. Yes. So what we're looking at, um, again, the plan that we're looking at reviewing in our board, we would be looking at fall, this fall, fall 21, to start certain implementing certain changes. That, and just to, Madam Chair, may I direct we go? 
Thank yes. you. And just to clarify, are you saying if this amendment passes or regardless of if this amendment passes? Regardless of this amendment. And that's and I apologize if I wasn't clear earlier when I spoke. That, that's what I was trying to indicate, that because we have this federal rescue plan money coming in, we are able, as well as the, the budget giving us our baseline uh, that was proposed, we are able to move forward at least with jump-starting our Better Bus plan. So it is not dependent on this additional money, if you will, for us to at least be able to jump-start what we're taking to our board for our fall service changes. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I have one more question for the administration. Um, many times when we're looking up at ramping up departments, when we're looking at increasing employee pay, when we're looking at more money for housing, whatever it is that we're looking to improve, um, it's often recommended that it's done on a more tiered approach. We, we can never do everything in one year. It's pretty much how it comes across. And it always has to be, we'll do a little bit now, we'll do a little bit next year. Um, even, we've seen that through multiple projects. Is there a reason why the administration believes that we can't take that approach with this? Is there a reason why we can't take the approach that has always been done with every other thing that the council and the body has wanted to do? Why we can't do that with funding those DLT positions and having half now and half later? Mr. Massimo. Uh, council member, this is a tiered approach. The 42 is not the full need to build out a DOT for a metro area with the complexity of infrastructure and the size of our system, especially with our growth. Um, and so this was what we knew would be required to stand up the DOT successfully and really begin to change those performance metrics that you uh, oftentimes, uh, that all council members oftentimes ask us about in terms of delivery of, of the projects and services and so forth. Um, but we anticipate and have plans looking forward for what those additional tiers of increase would be over the coming several years. So, so, so to be clear, you are wanting 42 now, and then additional positions will come later, but not necessarily next year? That's correct. Okay, and I, that, that's just, that's, that's hard for me when I see when we want to fund anything else that's a priority to, to us as the body and to our constituents, um, everything else is on a, 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 a wait type of approach. Like, we have to wait and do it. So it seems, it's, it's hard to conceptualize why this particular thing is so urgent that everything has to be done in one year. Um, I, I didn't know how I was going to vote on this. I, I applied Councilman O'Connell's efforts, but I wasn't really sure because I, I don't want to hurt the efforts of the Department of Transportation because we do have a lot of issues that we need to address with transportation. Um, but we also want to make sure that, that we are improving our better bus system and our transit. So after a lot of deliberation and hearing from the administration and hearing from my colleagues, I stand in support of Councilman O'Connell's uh, amendment and I ask my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell and then Councilwoman Bircher. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a couple, couple final brief thoughts here. I mean, we, we've heard from the administration about sidewalks, all those things, but it's as if we haven't been doing transit for decades, right? I mean, we, it's, I don't want people to be in the, uh, the space of imagining that we can't have a transit system unless everything else is perfect. Again, I left intact deliberately the transportation planning capacity, all of the things that would actually go to multimodal delivery. A signal tech is not going to build your sidewalk, right? A, you know, none of these positions that I am eliminating are going to contribute to the multimodal things we're talking about. And ultimately, that's what this comes down to, is that transit is the way that people access the city. I'm happy to get a DOT off the ground, and the DOT that we are getting off the ground has 22 new employees in it. Those new employees are going to be focused on improvements to service delivery. I'm happy to sit down and talk with the administration tonight or in the morning further about ways to advance both goals. I do consider this a both and approach. This establishes a new, higher, and better baseline for transit service. It also establishes a new NDOT with 22 employees who are going to be focused on service delivery. Uh, Beyond that, then we are looking at a, a future where more people will have access to more of the city more often, and that is what we all ought to be working toward, generally speaking. And uh, I would say, as someone who 
only lives in my neighborhood because I was able to access transit service reliably. I, I owned my house before I owned a car. Uh, that is that is why this is such a cause of passion to me. We have seen now both capital and operating budgets that have fallen short. The administration knows my perspective on that. It is fine for us to differ, and this is this is the expression of that dis disagreement. And I encourage colleagues to support. And thank you for those that have have understood my argument here. I would also say. Uh, Regardless of where we come out, be somewhat skeptical of this. If you know the current state of the Public Works Department as we are making this transition, it needs attention before it needs employees. We're not going to solve some of these problems that are plaguing all of our districts right now by adding 42 new employees. 22 will start the NDOT and will establish a higher baseline for transit. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Bircher. My colleagues summed it all up. I, I don't even want us to get into the weeds about the implementation or lack thereof of, of sidewalks and, and other infrastructures by, by, by the Public Works Department Chair. So he, he summed it up uh, very eloquently. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. So I'm looking for additional discussion on Amendment 2. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. We're going to do hands. Okay. So we're going to have to do hands. All those in favor, raise your hand. Oppose. Tell no. them raise them high. No alligator arms. <laughs> <laughs> Oppose. No. Abstentions. Eight in yeah. favor, one against, four abstaining. Motion carries. All right, moving on to amendment number three by Councilman Sledge. Councilman Sledge. Oh, thank you, Chair. Sorry. I've... Oh, first, can I get a motion to get amendment three in front of us? I'll, I'll make the motion. I'm on the committee. All right, it's been properly moved and seconded. On to discussion, Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very briefly, so I think some of you have seen both the uh, amendment description and then um, several, I think, board members from the Venture Science Center have written in to give a little bit of context. Uh, typically, this body over the last several years has given a, a subsidy, essentially, to the Venture Science Center to help cover uh, some of the costs of field trips that go um, from MPS students and for low-income students and the and typically that amount has ranged it's usually been somewhere around total about hundred and seventy five thousand um, dollars TCA requires us to, to put in what's in the both the substitute and the original budget which was twenty five thousand so this amendment would partially restore that subsidy that subsidy went away last year obviously because of the pandemic they were not receiving students. They are going to be receiving students again starting this fall. Um, so again, this is a partial restoration of those funds in order to help cover, um, help defray some of the costs of what they do, which is offer free um, uh, trips, free admission, essentially, and subsidize admission to Davidson County um, students and teachers and their, facu their faculty and staff. Um, I should know, I, I did have a conversation with the administration about this, talked with the finance director and with Mr. Jamison. Um, there is the potential that the Science Center could receive some uh, funding like this from the American Rescue Plan. So in part, that is why I'm not asking for the full amount. Um, and I had a conversation with the director of the Venture Science Center and we kind of all came to that, or, or he and I came to that point of, well, let's ask for this amount. Um, and I selected this unallocated uh, basically a contingency fund because that amount matched up. There's really no other reason but that. Um, so with that, I would just ask for colleagues' support. Thank you, Chair. Councilman Mendez. I guess I'm not sure who the right person is um, about this, uh, but I guess I'm, I'm interested in a couple different things. I know um, in connection with the, well, to start, the charter does require 25000 a year or some amount per year for the it, it authorizes that amount. Authorizes. I think it's maybe 50 for Adventure Science Center, 15. 15. Okay. It's and, a small amount. It was set in 1962. And, and there's just. 
And and there's there's just two nonprofits identified in the charter, the right? Symphony and Adventure Science Center. Right. And um, I know because we had a conversation um, in some of the um, budget and finance committee hearings about um, whether um, we should be appropriating money directly to nonprofits without um, uh, uh, contracts and scope of services and checks and balances. I, I guess historically, um, we've, for at least some of the time I've been in office, we've given money above the minimum in the charter to the Venture Science Center with no um, strings attached. Right. Uh, state law allows council to make um, grants to nonprofits through the budget ordinance. Okay. So just by naming the organization, that's sufficient. All right. And and then um, I, I didn't catch, I, I think Councilman Sledge was clear, but I, I wasn't, um, I didn't catch it all. What, what, what was this in two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, and what did we do last year? Anybody? Ms. Wiggins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, FY20 was the 25,000 from the charter plus an additional 150 for a total of 175. Last year was just the charter of 25. The current um, budget, I believe, has the 50,000. So this would be adding 100 to that. All right, thanks. I appreciate it. All right, any other, any other discussion on Amendment 3? Councilwoman Suara. I guess my question is, is it because the, I support the Adventure Science Center, so let me put that out there. But I was just curious because I know there's a lot of non-for-profits that are going to go through the application process that we're setting up. So are they excluded from that because they are in the charter? Is that the reason why they're not going through the newly set up process that we've been told for every non-for-profit that we brought up during budget? Our intention is, and there's an allowable uh, uh, utilization of the American Rescue Plan funds for nonprofits. Our intention is to have a, a process and an application process for that, and uh, a Venture Science Center would be entirely eligible to apply for that, those funds. So if this amendment fails, then they can get the same 100000 through that application process? Yes. Hypothetically? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any additional discussion on Amendment 3? All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Councilman Mendez. All right, motion carries. We also have a uh, late filed amendment by uh, Councilwoman Welsh. Can I get a uh, motion to get the late filed amendment in front of the committee? So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded. Councilwoman Welsh. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me find you. Councilwoman Thank you, Madam Welsh. Chair. I appreciate that. Um, it's been said that the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And that is what I think that we as a body have been doing and continue to do when we continue to fund MN, um, MPM, the National Police Department at an ever increasing level, even when we don't get the outcomes that we desire and even when we know we won't get the outcomes that we desire. And we do it at the expense of everything else that we know contributes to a positive and healthy quality of life. I know that many of my colleagues here do not have the stomach to cut funding for law enforcement in any significant way in one fell swoop and feel that we can work toward the goal of redirecting some of MNPD dollars to more appropriate providers incrementally. And though I don't really agree with that, um, it is also the definition of madness to keep bringing to the council floor legislation that you know won't pass. And so I don't wish to do that and hence my amendment. I believe if we truly believe that we can move forward incrementally, this amendment is a good place to start. I don't believe having a police present in schools sends the right message to our kids. Research shows that having police in schools increases arrest and suspension rates, even in children as young as seven years old. 
Research shows that police and schools result in harsher disciplinary measures and poor kids, non-white kids, and kids with special needs bear the brunt. Some research even shows that police in schools lowers graduation rates. Police do not belong in schools. Given what we have all gone through collectively with COVID, and given the psychological toll this has taken on everyone, but especially our kids, I believe it is incumbent upon us that we make sure our kids have the tools, resources, support, and guidance they need to navigate their way to the other side of this crisis and regain their mental health. We need school psychologists and nurses present in schools every day to address the challenges our kids are facing when they arise, as they arise. Let us invest in the mental welfare of our kids. Let's give our kids what they truly need to thrive and help them and keep them safe and healthy mentally and psychologically. Please, I ask for your support of this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilwoman Welsh, before I uh, call on uh, council members, I know this is something that I looked into last year uh, and talked with representatives from MMPS about the proposition of removing school resource officers from schools. Have you had any conversations with folks from MMPS? I have not yet, no. Okay. All right, uh, and I know there are some folks from MMPS in leadership at MMPS uh, in the audience but I'll call on uh, Councilman Cash first. Thanks, I appreciate it. And I'm not on this committee, so if there are others in the queue that uh, you would prefer to put before me, that's fine. You can go ahead. All right, thanks. Um, I really appreciate uh, Council Member Welch bringing this up, and I think it's an, what she's talking about is an important conversation to be had, and, and, it, and when, when there is um, support and that conversation ha has reached a lot of the public, and they've had a chance to weigh in, I think it's a good idea. Um, but I don't think that conversation has taken place within the school communities yet. I don't think, I don't think the school board members or school communities have talked with their uh, stakeholders uh, to find out if this is something that they want. Um, we, we kind of have, we, like, this is something that the school board put in their budget, and now we're kind of questioning if, we're talking about this, so we're kind of questioning what the school board, we're saying, we want you to cut this line item and, and put it in this line item. Uh, I, I don't think this is appropriate for, uh, only for a budget line and, and an amendment to a budget without having a full conversation. I asked earlier if this is gonna to go to the education committee, it is not. And this is kind of a big conversation for it to just be, as important as it may be, it, to be a budget, uh, a, line, a budget amendment. Um, so we kinda, of, we kind of, and you, some of you may have heard this from me before, but we kinda of have like the school board, because they passed a budget with this money in it for, for patrol, for uh, SROs, and now we're, this body is qu might question what the school board did. Uh, I'm gonna raise the alternative that what, uh, another option is that we ask the schools what they want and what they need. Do they want and need an SRO or would they rather take that money and spend it on a uh, psychi psychologist or uh, nurses? Uh, and, and I would absolutely support that conversation uh, and think we should stand by the schools and what they say they need. But I don't know that that conversation at the school level has taken place yet. Thank so, you. Thank you. So we have Mr. Mark North in the audience. And I believe Councilman Cash, I believe the SRO, SRO allocation of 6.8 million is in the MMPD budget. But Mr. North, if you can explain what that relationship is first, and then if you can respond, go to that same, uh, and then if you could respond um, to any discussions that there's been within MMPS about SROs. So the uh, school resource officers are hired by and uh, the police department. It is funded um, through the police department budget. Now the the school board's budget, um, 
don't want to say presumes, but takes into account that 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 has been funded through through the through the police department. There are SROs, and I think expect uh, this year that there will be school resource officers uh, in the high schools and middle schools uh, like there like there have been in the past. And 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 that conversation to change that, I don't believe has happened uh, at the um, at the school board. Uh, and that would be, I think, I, I suggest an important step to take before you, before you. And one, one more thing I want to touch on that, that um, uh, there may be some unintended uh, consequences financially uh, that, that's, that's what unintended consequences are, is, is something you wouldn't expect. Uh, but um, the, the funding of SROs uh, covers some required local matching uh, for some school safety grants at the state level. Uh, and so removing that might uh, jeopardize some of those grants that are used for, um, I, I don't have all the details, but maybe some mentorship programs, uh, some of the um, uh, vestibule, safety vestibules, that sort of thing. So that, that's another uh, thing to take into account. Councilman Cash. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to be clear that I'm, I'm, my uh, argument here is not for one or the other, but that there's a, there's, that we shouldn't, we don't have to have all resource officers or all nurses and, and counselors, but that when there's decision for the school, a decision for the schools themselves to make, uh, I think it's win-win for the schools. Um, and I, you know, I'm not that worried. I'm not as worried about the grants and stuff like that. And I think, uh, you know, we spending a grant on something that a school doesn't feel that they need, a school community doesn't feel that they need. I, I'm not sure that that's really money wasted. Uh, however, if the school does want that, then then it is. Uh, thank you for the follow-up. So, Mr. North, as I said um, earlier, this is something that I know I approached MMPS leadership with in regard to the possibility of removing SROs from schools. Has there been, and that was back in October of last year, um, is there an official stance, mm -hmm. and I know you were not prepared to talk about this today, um, but is there an official stance or can you caucus with whomever you need to caucus with to come with one tomorrow um, in regard to MMPS and the presence of SROs in schools? I, I will need to caucus with someone and get you something before tomorrow. Okay. Well, if you, I'll, I'm coming to you, Councilwoman Sorry, If you could get with whomever you need to talk to, as I recall my conversation uh, with Dr. Battle, um, school board member uh, Peter Players was on the in the meeting, and I can't remember if it was Mr. Henson or Mr. Clay, um, and I know that was several months ago, but if you can get with Dr. Battle and whomever you need to on the school board, uh, whether that's Chair Bugs or whomever, to get a position um, on behalf of MMPS in regard to SROs in schools. I will have a definitive answer to you tomorrow. Okay. Councilwoman Suara. Thank you, uh, Chair. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm interested in knowing that because the conversation that, that I've had or heard about was relating to liability and all the stuff, and that's why it's been so soft. But regardless of that, I am in support of the amendment. Uh, I really do not believe that having police officers in school is necessary. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot of, I mean, we have, we have, when you talk school to prison pipeline, you, you, we are a county, or a count, county that used to put uh, elementary school students in jail. And that come out of having officers in school and now they're dealing with children. So, but I, I hesitated on proposing the amendment originally because I thought MMPS was saying that there was something in liability and I was hoping to hear that. But if the only reason why MMPS is, is reluctant is because of a grant, it even pisses me off more, like because it shouldn't be about money. It shouldn't be about getting extra grant. 
Uh, and this is not needed in our school. From what everybody is saying, if you have the counselors to work with these kids, when we're talking about SEL, we, we, we spend a whole lot of time on it. We know we're not funding all of that adequately. And, and, and my, my suggestion is that if we only have it to get more money from the states, then that is not a reason to have them in school further. I mean, I don't think we need them in the school, but the fact that it's also financially based even gives more reason not to have them at all. And so I am in support of the amendment, and I ask everyone to support it. Is there any other discussion on the late filed amendment? And uh, Director Cooper, can you explain what the process is on the floor tomorrow since this is late filed? So all amendments to the budget have to be considered by the Budget and Finance Committee before they can be considered on the council floor. So that hurdle has been met here. However, because it was late filed, the rules will have to be suspended in order to bring it forward tomorrow night. Um, and that would require um, almost unanimous consent. If there were two objections, it could not be considered. All right. Councilwoman Benedict. Thank you, Chair. I want to commend my colleague from District 16 who has brought this amendment forward. Um, she and I have very similar passions in a lot of, a lot of things, and um, she uh, tends to bring them to the floor in a great, awesome way, um, and, and that's what she's done here this time as well. Um, I am in support of this. I think that there, we, officers in our schools, um, the, the reasons have already been stated, and they can't be overstated enough in my mind. We are treating our kids in a way that we shouldn't treat our adults. And by keeping these officers in school, we need to be focused, especially after this past year, you know, we, we added some money into SEL, in, into the, the substitute budget. There's so many aspirational needs for our schools, and this is one that could have a real impact to our kids. I hope to hear more from MNPS tomorrow um, whether that's through email between now and then or something that will help us understand a bit more um, how we could successfully um, um, make this happen and get police out of our schools and give kids the resources that they need, the support that they need. Um, and, and so with that, I'm going to absolutely support a suspension of the rules tomorrow, and I'm also going to support this amendment tonight and also tomorrow night. Thank you, Chair. And, and Mr. North, um, when you're caucusing can you also have a discussion and bring back an answer tomorrow that if the 6.8 million dollars were transferred to MNPS whether or not MNPS would in turn contract with MNPD to maintain SRO officers is that is that clear so if you got the 6.8 in your budget would you in turn still contract with MNPD to keep SROs in the schools Councilwoman Porterfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a, a couple of questions, and I want to start with, I think I've been really vocal on um, the fact that I don't think we need SRO officers in school, so I want to start with that. Um, as a former educator, I often saw SRO officers used inappropriately when there was an instance where behavior should have been addressed by the teacher or the administrator. There were times when SRO officers were called in. My understanding is that SRO officers are only in the building to address crime and not to address um, student behavior. So I think that, um, I, again, I, am, I support not having SRO officers in the schools. However, if SRO officers are in the schools, there needs to be a very clear understanding on what the role of the SRO officer is in the building. Um, my question is, because uh, like you, Councilmember Toombs, I was also looking to figure out how we can remove SRO officers from the schools, and it was my understanding um, at that time that it was not the will of MMPS to do that, and not, I'm not trying to throw MMPS under the bus, but I do want to get clarification because I think this is something that uh, we need to know and that we need to be clear about. Um, if it was the will to remove SRO officers from uh, the schools, I believe the school board could have done that in their budget. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with this because I personally believe, 100% believe that SRO officers don't have a place in the schools. I also believe that we are here to allocate the funds to the department 
and that it, it, it is hard for us to go over. It is hard in the sense of the, 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 our constituents elected their school board members. The school board members should be the ones that are saying what is appropriate in their budget or not. So I'm struggling with this, uh, Council Member Welsh. So, and I just want to make that very clear. Uh, right now, today, I'm leaning on the side of abstaining until we get an official position from MNPS. But I don't. It's OK. Like, it, it's OK. It's all right. Um, but right now, I'm leaning on the side of abstaining until we get an official position from MNPS because I think we need to be very clear on what, uh, what MNPS has stated, what they are wanting to do. I do think that we need to give MNPS the opportunity to speak with their parents and to speak with the school board. We need to know what that body wants to do. Um, my next question is, if this amendment does pass on tomorrow, um, are we guaranteed that this money would, would only come from the SRO program? Like, is there any way that the money could come from any other departments, or do we know for sure that this money would come from, uh, would, would defund the SRO program for uh, MNPS? Director Cooper, it's my understanding if, if we were to cut 6.8 million, it would really be up to the discretion of the department where that 6.8 comes from. The same with MNPS receiving the 6.8 million, it would be up to MNPS's discretion as to what the 6.8 million was spent on. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we have any information from um, Chief Drake or anyone with MNPD? Have we heard anything that if this amendment passes, do we know that, that they're going to cut the funds from, from the SRO program? Uh, well, the, the amendment was, was just requested today, so I, I know that um, the police department hasn't seen it or, or offered any, any input. All right. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Cooper. Councilman Cash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, since we're doing a little, since we're digging a little deeper into this, which I like, uh, I am curious about, and this, I don't know that this can be answered today, but if we could get an answer to this since, since we've asked for some uh, feedback. I, I'm curious about, so I, as a longtime Metro teacher, I knew that I was, I had, um, I had certain responsibilities to protect student rights, student privacy rights. And I'm just wondering if when we have other employees that are with other departments, I believe that the school nurses, even though MNPS contracts, they're within the health department. And the, the police are within the um, police department, obviously. And so I guess I'm wondering what privacy rules about things that happen inside the school are these employees that are not MNPS employees subject to? In other words, um, you know, I, I suspect that there are HIPAA rules that that guide what the um, you know medical professionals uh, can and cannot share within their department. But what like can can SRO officers learn things about students in the schools and then share that within the department? Or I, I guess I, I guess I want to know how protected those rights are since the SROs are not huh? school employees. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, Councilman. Was that a, a, a budget question or was that a, a policy question? I guess it was a, I guess it was a policy question. Okay. But but it would help me know how I more how I feel about gotcha. the okay. about the because uh, we, we I mean somebody somebody before me said something about learning more about the role of the SROs and I feel like. This is a question related to that role of the SROs. Councilwoman Welsh and then Councilwoman Suar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to pick up on something that Councilmember Porterfield mentioned about the role of the SROs and um, what their uh, how they are t supposed to be interacting with students within the school system. I feel like in many um, instances, because school systems in general are, are underfunded, including until our budget passes tomorrow, our particular school system is underfunded, that we rely on SROs to do uh, jobs that administrators and teachers would be better equipped to do. And I feel um, that it's really- Can we be really respectful in the gallery, please? 
Um, and I just feel that it's really important that we acknowledge that, that there are people within school buildings that are better trained to deal um, with mental health issues with, and behavioral issues with students. And we need to be supporting those people who are, are in the position to actually provide quality support and have a positive outcome for the child. And we don't need to be bringing in and, and having grants coming from the state to bring in people who really aren't the, the most qualified people to provide the services. So I just think that's something that we need to keep in mind as we vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Suara. I think I remember which uh, which touched on what I was going to say. Um, I do remember during the budget conversation that even the chief was talking about these SROs now will be moved from one department to the other because there is a need to understand that, that the, the mindset and the way that these SR officers deal with the children are not adequate, and so they want to move them into the office or something. And so it goes back to the to the same conversation we have on mental health, that why do we need to retrain our officers to deal with children when we already have counselors and psychologists that are trained that can do the same job. And so this is what this is doing. Rather than recreating the police department and teaching them what to do with the children, let's go with counselors and, and, and psychologists that we know that in the aspirational budget that MMPS submitted, we're not funded and will do the job better. Uh, uh, we cannot talk about how behavioral issues should be handled in school. We cannot talk about how you talk to kids and how you help them gain, gain confidence, rather than being punitive all the time. This is still within this, that same conversation, and I think that's where we need to start thinking about that. We need to move all of this out of the police and put it in the psychologist department. Now, my question that I have or clarification or something that I want to talk about is, it has been mentioned that yes, we, when we allocate the 6.8 million to MMPS, we really cannot force them to put it towards the counselors and psychologists. I'm gonna push back that the amendment that we've done on the pay plan, on the seven days for the employees, follows the same logic. And so if we are on record as saying that the 1.4 goes to the seven day, the 1.2 goes to the advocacy center, the 6.8 goes to counselors. And I think that's what we need to do. Thank you. Councilwoman Porterfield, oh, Councilwoman Porterfield and Councilman Mendez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I want to say that I absolutely agree with Council Members Welsh and Soror. Um, uh, a SRO officer is not the person that's equipped to deal with a child in crisis. They're not the person that's equipped to dealing with a child who has behavior concerns. Um, my concern and what I've seen is that as teachers, some, sometimes, not all teachers, but there are some teachers who weaponize SRO officers when a child is not compliant. So for example, if a child has their head down, instead of finding out what's wrong with the child, how can I help you, how can I support you, or calling a counselor, they will call an SRO officer to remove that child from the classroom, which is a complete inappropriate use So I just want uh, of an SRO officer. So I want to make sure that, that we all are kind of operating from the same amount of, of, of information here. SRO officers should not be used and are not supposed to be used from my understanding, and I would love if we can get this in that statement from MMPS tomorrow, if we can get um, clarification on their stance and if there's an MOU with MMPD on what the SRO officers are supposed to be doing, because when I have tried to work on this in the past, what I was specifically told was that SRO officers were there only to address crimes and safety issues. So for example, if there were a school shooting, a SRO officer would be there in that example. We know that that does not always work. We, we've seen in the school shooting in uh, Florida where the SRO officer left the premises and left the children. So the, the officers are not, they themselves, equipped to, to completely uh, support a school in the, in the um, act of a, an emergency situation. Um, the, the other question to that is, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought, but if we can get from MMPS what exactly the role of the SRO officer is in the building, I think that that will also help us to make a, a better decision. Because if, if, if the thought is that the role is to help support behavior, that's not their job. That's not what they're there for. That's why we have teachers, counselors, SEL, advocacy centers, all of those things. If the role is to address crime in the school, uh, if the role is to address safety in the school, then that's a different conversation that we need to figure out what that would look like. Um, so thank you for Madam Chair, and, and to be clear, I'm asking the MMPS provides us tomorrow 
with information about the role of the SRO officer and if there is an MOU between MMPD and MMPS and if we can get a copy of that tomorrow prior to our vote. Thank you, Chair. Councilman Mendez. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, uh, a couple things. One, um, unlike some of the things we're doing with pay plan where we can itemize it, um, we absolutely cannot tell if we pass this where MNPD cuts it or what schools do, does with it. We absolutely cannot. I think uh, Mr. Cooper said that earlier. Um, just the, um, the, the way this amendment is written um, and the line item, the 6.8 would go to in the school budget, we would have zero control over how they spend it. Now, depending on your perspective, you might consider that's a good thing or a bad thing. The reality is some of what um, Councilman Cash was talking about, the fact that we can't control it may actually give everybody involved the flexibility if the school board said, gee, we really don't want to get rid of completely SROs, but half of them, fine, um, then they could work it out with MNPD and they could move the money around and still do it. Um, to me, because um, I, I think the, the fact that we can't dictate where police would cut it or where schools would add it, how they would add it, I think that gives more flexibility, I think, to um, support the amendment um, because um, we're, we're, we can just allocate the money and it would be a message um, uh, for everybody who's heard from our constituents last year, this year, um, about trying to reallocate uh, police budget toward other uses. Um, this comes out to be a pretty discreet, roughly 3% of the MNPD budget that um, we know that we're talking about, it's for SROs. It would leave room for the police department, the school board to figure out what the best balance was and uh, I think it uh, provides more flexibility and is a, a down payment on the um, hopefully ongoing process of moving money into um, more uh, social services as opposed to through the police budget. So thank you. Did I miss anyone's hand? Oh, Councilman Young. Councilman Mendez pretty much uh, made the point I was making, and I, I think regardless of, of how anyone thinks about all this, uh, if anyone on this council wants more direct say on the operations of metropolitan schools, then I encourage them next year to run for the school board when about half those seats are up. Um, because we, we, our job as the Metro Council is to fund the schools and the elected school board's job is to operate the schools. So, I, I, like Councilman Mendez was saying, we, we can stand here and talk about what our intentions are for this money till we're blue in the face, but um, once we send over that check, if you will, to the school board, if they want to go out and buy red lollipops to give out on Tuesdays with that extra money, they can do it. And, and I don't mean to trivialize things, but I just want to make sure that, that everyone understands that um, we, we don't have that authority to, to tell them how they get to use that money. And so I, I, I would hate for folks to, to go along with this and then be disappointed if the schools don't uh, work with the confines of what, what the intent of this amendment is. Uh, so I, I think this is a much, uh, I, I think there's a better opportunity for an actual discussion to happen with the school board and maybe the education committee or, 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 or the council members concerned about this rather than it being a, a late filed budget amendment uh, that I, I think leaves too many loopholes for, for things to happen that are, is not the intent of anyone on this body. But uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any other discussion on the late filed amendment? Councilwoman Porterfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one question for the uh, sponsor, if I may. Can we get any clarity on why the amendment was late filed as opposed to a timely filed amendment? Oh. Thank you. Um, yes, I was sick and it was sitting in my outbox and I didn't realize until today that I actually, actually hadn't sent the amendment last week before I was felled. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope you're feeling better, Council Member. <laughs> 
All right, I am scanning the room for additional hands. I know we are way over, but we are talking about the budget, so. Um, all right, seeing no hands. All those in uh, favor of passing late a filed amendment, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. We're gonna have to do hands. All right, all those in favor, say aye. I mean, raise your hand, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Opposed, raise your hand. Two. Abstentions? What we got? So four in favor, two against, three abstaining. So what does that mean? Is that that's some passes, right? Yes. All right. Uh, motion passes. All right, so now we are on the substitute as amended. I believe all the amendments, the recommendation is, is approval. Um, so we're on the substitute as amend, amended. Can I get a uh, motion, please? Yeah. Yes, Councilman Roden. Four, two, and three. But there were two against. I saw at least three hands up, oh. so. Okay, I just want to get the numbers okay, if right, someone so put I, their hand down before okay we can do it again okay all those in favor of amendment the late filed amendment raise your hand okay, Four. okay. all those opposed to the late filed amendment raise your hand Four. Four. all those abstaining raise your hand Okay, so that's four, four. So there's no recommendation. So no recommendation. So there's no recommendation on amend on the late filed amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. And obviously, we all know the procedure. You can still move the amendment on the floor. Right. Move to suspend. Well, the moves rules. you have, for the late file. You had to move to suspend the rules. Sorry. Okay, so we are on the proposed substitute as amended. Again, can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded to um, pass the amendment, I'm sorry, substitute as amended. It's been a long meeting. Uh, so there are several um, amendments to the language of the ordinance, and I'll ask Director Cooper to help me out. Um, So there's a, a state law that allows us to give a discount on, on property tax um, bills if people pay them early. Um, and so there was a um, request from Councilwoman Hurt to do that program, to alpha that discount. However, it is unknown what the fiscal impact of that would be if folks, you know, a huge number of people took advantage of that and what the lost income would be. So the um, compromise and what's included in the substitute is to do a, a feasibility study to see um, basically how that program would work for Davidson County and what the proposed, uh, the projected lost income would be. Also, there is, and I've lost my page on here. If you could tell me my page, by the way. Looking for the spreadsheet or the. Okay. But there is one other thing that was in there. That was. Oh, um, in the language? It was the feasibility study as well as the, the um, ability of the finance director. Any. Yeah. There's also a change to the uh, authority of the finance director to spend certain amount of money in, a, in case of, thank you, in times of emergency. Um, basically gives council more oversight over how money is spent. Um, yeah. And then moving on to the actual change of, changing around of monies, the substitute moves around uh, $13.6 million, and that is allocated as follows. To fire, to the fire department and EMS services, it's 15 fire positions and 10 EMS positions for $1,149,800, and that's funding for a half year, so starting January 1, 2022, um, the fire department will be able to hire for those positions. Uh, under the Department of Health, 
is the new animal control positions, which is two animal control officers and one kennel assistant for $170,200. Those are uh, fully funded positions. Also under the Department of Health is a $818,000 to the Mental Health Cooperatives Crisis Treatment Center. Um, pay, pan, pay plan improvements, the amendments from the Civil Service Commission, the step increase as well as the 1% raise for the open range employees in the amount of uh, about $5.2 million. Parks and Recreation funding for 17.8 um, FTEs, $662,500, which is funding for half a year. Under MMPS, $1.2 million for pay for seven professional development days for all uh, support staff. Uh, $1.4 million for advocacy centers for remaining elementary schools. Uh, if you recall from previous discussions, there's current funding for about 55 schools. However, there are 72 elementary schools, so this money would fund the remainder of those. Also, there's $545,900 to reduce the student to psychologist ratio. Under public works, there's one full-time position for the East Convenience Center for $59,100 under public library. Um, there's $381,500 for funding for one half year, so starting January 1st, 2022, for Friday library hours for those branches that don't currently have Friday library hours. Also, there's $262,700 for library curbside service. Under social services, there's $150,000 for um, two full-time positions in the homeless division. There is $100,000 for the Metro Arts Restorative Program. There is $50,000 to human resources for training materials. Under community support, there is $1 million for a Cure Violence North Nashville pilot. Under Metropolitan Council, there's $277,800 for fully funded uh, positions to administrative officers for travel, translation services, and software needs. The software needs is the, the, bang, the um, bang the table software that Councilwoman Suarez has advocated for. Um, under county clerk, they're staffing for two positions for $128,700. And that is your total of $13,600,000. Uh, There's also, um, some other changes, there is a increase of $2.4 million to the Central Business Improvement District. Um, there is an appropriation from reserves for under event and marketing for $1,411,500. And then there's the Safety and Cleanliness Fund. Yeah, that's the $2.4 million okay. for the CBID. Okay, so that, that goes with the Central Business Improvement District, that increase. And so I just want to um, say that there's been a, a lot of work put into the substitute. Uh, when I initially became chair of budget and finance, I met with several departments, several community groups to get an idea of, of what was important to those different entities. Councilwoman Porterfield and I implemented the 11 part budget 101 series, all 11 sessions are available on YouTube, the Metro Nashville Network. You can um, Google uh, community budget education and all 11 um, sessions will come up. Um, this built upon the six sessions that Councilman Mendez and I did when he was the chair and I was vice chair. We went around the county and held community meetings on the budget, all in a, a desire to be as transparent and collaborative as possible to really hear from the community and what people thought about our finances and to explain the process. Um, since then, I've, I've met weekly with the finance department. I've had several meetings with the administration, again, bringing to them all of the conversations I would hear on Facebook, on Twitter, um, in uh, council members' uh, comments on the floor and in committee meetings. All of those conversations are in this substitute. Uh, I try to strike a balance in addressing the many needs that we have as a city. Obviously, $13.6 million doesn't address every single need that we have, but I hope that it is a substantial down payment in how what our priorities are as a city, which is the residents of Davidson County, uh, and, and making sure that they have the resources that they need to to live and work here and, and to, to be productive and, and, and to be... Um, to live well, hopefully. 
Um, so with that, I would ask that my colleague support the substitute as amended. Councilwoman Suara. Um, I know it's a mute point. I hope everybody's already in support, but I just want to state it for the record that I do support the substitute, and I want to uh, acknowledge and, and thank Madam Chair for a job well done, like she said, uh, all the listening sessions and also uh, listening to everyone. I know that what the Minority Caucus and myself and a whole lot of us put forward, uh, you were open to it and you find a way to make it work. More importantly, and I think it's, it's, it's important to note that you were able to do that without uh, recommending an increase in taxes. Uh, which is what we had to do last year in order to be able to have a substitute. So I want to commend you for a job well done. I think uh, your temperament, your patience, uh, your ability, uh, I said somebody would have moved me out of here. Uh, so so, so I, I, I do working collaboratively, <laughs> collaboratively with everyone and listening, not just in your listening sessions across the county, but also to your colleagues uh, is what, what, that's why a lot of people are not objecting, and I hope, do hope that we're not. Uh, and I, and I want to just thank you for your job well done, and I hope everybody supports it. Thank you. And thank you, Councilwoman Sara, for your weekly budget sessions that you did last year as well as this year to, again, be transparent and inform the public and help them understand our budget. Any additional discussion on the substitute as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. The last item on our agenda is Bill 2021-737. And before we, before we finish, I just want to remind folks, after the planning meeting, we have a joint budget and finance and planning committee meeting to discuss the capital improvements budget. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Bill 2021-737, Tombs establishes the tax levy in the general services district for the fiscal year 2021 to 2022 and declares the amount required for the annual operating budget of the urban services district. Can I get a motion? It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Director Cooper, can you tell us what the tax levy is just for the viewing audience. Yes, the tax levy is what the council just recommended approval on at the certified tax rate. Um, it will be uh, $3, I'm sorry, $2, two dollars, 2.953 in the GSD and 0.335 in the USD for a combined rate of 3.288. Any additional discussion on Bill 2021-737? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion carries. And that completes the business of the Budget and Finance Committee meeting adjourned until about 45 minutes from now. <laughs> it shouldn't take that long. I think this one will be pretty short. Planning should be short.